thank you. Uh, I think we can try to share the screen. Yeah, so I can introduce myself and Sean as well. So uh, we are from TV KPEC, and I, I'm, I'm Brian Go. I am I'm the developer business coordinator for TV KPEC. So for TV KPEC, we are actually a adoption uh, entity uh, that is supported by the Tezos Foundation in Switzerland. And you know, uh, we support happy people or developers to be develop protocols and platforms and application on Tezos Cloud. So uh, some of it could be you know, in terms of market research or, or finance related applications. Uh, and so uh, what what my primary job uh, uh, in in TV feedback is uh, I conduct work workshops and and hackathons and. A lot of it are to deal with, uh, you know, NUS or SMU or, or NTU uh, students, and uh, we we did this kind of uh, for for workshop for for uh, in this year is quite a, like a number of, of workshops for for them as well to learn more towards like you know the business structure, and then there's a lot more uh, deeper things like decentralized finance and NFTs and uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, I would like to. Us, but then Sean is actually uh, the the developer uh, the developer in TZ feedback. So uh, we are actually uh, we are actually going to conduct the smart the smart smart contracts uh, about Trump for you as well. And uh, if Sean you want to do for for yourself as well. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Uh, can you hear me? Is the screen okay? Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you and the screen is showing, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so just a short introduction about myself. Um, my name is Sean and actually like eight years ago, I graduated from Daman High School. Uh, so it's quite interesting to see some of the teachers uh, who have taught me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's quite interesting to see some of the teachers from Daman High School here as well. Um, afterwards, I went to SCTE and I did uh, information system there. Uh, right now, I actually graduated about three to four months ago, and I'm a developer now at TZ APEC. Um, so today will be quite an interesting uh, time together. So uh, what we'll be covering is a few stuff. Um, first of all, we'll introduce you to blockchain. I know some of you probably already know why it's a blockchain and some of you don't. Um, and then we'll talk about a little bit about the consensus mechanism as well. Um, the blockchain trilemma, why we need blockchain. And also, of course, we'll introduce you to Tezos. Um, and then we'll touch a little bit on smart contracts and what they are. And then there'll, this, there'll be this long part where we'll do hands-on coding. Um, so I know like y'all don't really like all the le long lectures and stuff. Um, so we'll try to make it more hands-on as possible. Um, yeah, so without any further ado, um, we'll get started. Anyway, like I'm really happy to see like um, blockchain and coding like picking up in, in JC. Um, I think it was something that I wish I took up earlier uh, back in my time. And it's also good for students to be able to explore um, different areas of the industry um, before going to university, which they have to kind of choose uh, what they want to focus on. And that, that will sort of determine, you know, their career trajectory. Yeah, so to start off, um, we'll be touching about what is blockchain. Um, and blockchain basically is just a distributed ledger that is being stored um, immutably um, on the internet in a decentralized manner. So you can think of it as like, uh, basically just a database um, that is distributed, stored in different computers. Um, and this all stems from a very basic problem, which is also known as the Byzantine problem, general problem. Um, so to, to sort of illustrate this very quickly, imagine there's like four, four commanders trying to attack a castle, right? And they all plan to attack it like during dawn. And then they need to come to a consensus that all of them acknowledge that, okay, six o'clock, we are going to launch an attack. Uh, so that's something that they all have to reach a consensus about. And there's a lot of different ways they can do this, right? They can send their, their assistants on horses to go and spread the news. But in the meantime, in the middle, they might get hijacked or something. So to, to better illustrate this, I'm going to show you a very quick four minute video, uh, which kind of wraps up the whole idea very, very neatly for me. Uh, so I'm going to explain it by... Can you guys hear the sound from the video? Okay. Using an ancient problem that Bitcoin claims to have solved. It's called the Byzantine General's Problem, and until now, it's been unsolvable. The problem goes like this. 
how do you make absolutely sure that multiple entities which are separated by distance are in absolute full agreement before an action is taken? In other words, how can individual parties find a way to guarantee full consensus? Here's the example. Imagine that you are a general in the Byzantine army and you're planning to attack an enemy city. You have the city surrounded by several battalions, each of them camped several miles from the other, and each of them led by another general. A coordinated attack on the city from all sides at the same time will be successful, but an uncoordinated attack will likely end in defeat. You have decided to attack at dawn, but you have no walkie-talkies or cell phones and signals from flags, torches, or smoke could be seen by the enemy. How do you make sure with absolute certainty that all of the other generals reach consensus and all attack together at dawn? You could send messengers on horseback, but what if one of them is captured or killed before delivering the message? You would need to have a reply from each of your generals confirming that they have received your message which means that they would have to send messengers to you on horseback, but what if they are captured or killed? What if a messenger is captured by the enemy and an imposter messenger with a fake reply is sent back to you? And how do the other generals know that the messages that they received from you are genuine and haven't been intercepted and altered by the enemy? Worse yet, what if some of the other generals are traitors and they send messages back to you confirming that they will attack at dawn when their true intention is to retreat. How can you ever be absolutely certain that all of your battalions will reach consensus and attack simultaneously? Like I said, this problem has remained unsolved for thousands of years, and at its core, it's all about individual parties being able to trust each other directly no strings attached. Bitcoin claims to have conquered this problem. Now imagine that the battalions are actually computers on a network and that the generals are copies of a computer program running a ledger. A ledger that, via some very complex math, records transactions and events in the exact order that they happen. The key here is that all of these ledgers are exactly the same for everyone. As soon as a change is made on one copy of a ledger, if it is proven to be true by the math, all other copies of the ledger are updated to match. What we have here is a distributed ledger that is also always in consensus. This is one of the first things to understand about Bitcoin. It is the first full consensus distributed ledger mankind has ever seen. This network can be expanded across the entire planet. It means that individual parties on opposite sides of the world can come to consensus on an event without requiring any third party as an intermediary for trust. Whether it's an order from a general to his troops or an order from you for a pizza, a distributed ledger confirms via math, whether an event is true and records it permanently. Bitcoin, the first full consensus distributed ledger, is a trust machine. Yeah, so I think that, that quickly sums up the Byzantine problem um, that has been unsolved for, for a lot of years. Um, and then basically Bitcoin came up with this distributed ledger, which sort, sort of solves it. Um, by having everyone store the same copy of data online, you can be sure that you know whatever that you are seeing on the blockchain is what the rest of the world is seeing. Yeah, so that's why it's so strong, right? Because if you think about it, transactions that go through your DBS, Payla, and stuff like that, you can say that you have paid. Um, the other party can say that they didn't receive it, and all this is based on a centralized organization, which is DBS, of course, to kind of govern this transaction. Yeah, so that's where the power of blockchain really came in and the transformative idea of blockchain. Yeah, so um, this is a quick summary of, of what the Byzantine problem is. Um, and basically what it's trying to solve is that, you know, there's no way of knowing reliable information and there's, there's no way of verifying that the information they receive from others of the, map, uh, of the network is correct. Yeah, so 
Um, the whole idea of it is to separate itself from centralized systems um, and build a trustless environment. Yeah. So, yeah, so basically centralized parties, what they do is they sacrifice trustlessness for efficiency. So organizing parties like your banks and stuff like that, they are the one that are doing all the audits, all the paperwork. And of course, it's the best, right? Because having there's, there's less information that needs to be transferred all over the place. You just need one central party to do everything. But at the same time, this com compromises um, sort of like at, at least it make it vulnerable to like uh, corruption and stuff like that. Yeah. So then we talk about consensus mechanism. So how can different parties from all over the world, different computers, how can they agree on a single true fact? Uh, and that is why then that's where consensus mechanism come in. So there's two that I'll talk about today, which is proof of work and proof of stake. Of course, if you go and Google, there are a lot of different algorithms that have came up over the past few years, um, proof of history, et cetera. So today we'll just talk about the two main ones. Um, so for proof of work, proof of work essentially, um, it requires a computer to randomly engage in hashing functions um, until it arrives at an output with the correct minimum amount of the correct value. Yeah, so in this case, why it's called proof of work is because it requires computationally expensive resources to kind of compute all these hashes, right? So it's sort of like a guessing game. So a competition between, let's say I'm a miner, it's a competition between me and the rest of the miners out there to see who can compute faster. And the faster you compute, the more hashes you can generate. There's a higher chance that you are the lucky one that strike, uh, that strike the right number that kind of satisfy the condition. And then you successfully mine that block and you get the rewards. Yeah, so for this case, like Bitcoin uses iteration of the SHA25 um, hashing algorithm to achieve this. Um, and it's very hard to alter it because uh, what happens is that for every block that's created, right, the hashing is evolved. The hashing requires the previous block. So that's why it's called a blockchain. So for someone to falsely mine the new block to say that, um, you know, someone owes me $10 million, for him to come up with this malicious act, he has to sort of remine all these previous blocks in the blockchain, which is very, very computationally extensive. Um, and with the long chain that Bitcoin is right now, it's almost impossible for anyone to submit any malicious notes. Yeah. So in essence, this is basically how it goes. You can see that the proposed block, um, you'll get secured with the hashing algorithm. Um, and then you will kind of, you'll try and generate with the nonce, together with the nonce, right? Nonce is just a random integer number that can only be used once. And then you have the previous block headers all below. Yeah, so these two combined with the proposed block gives you a hash number. And this hash number has to satisfy certain conditions for it to be considered approved or considered correct. Yeah, so all the hashes will basically be stuck in the for loop over there, right? They will check whether the hash value is less than the target value. And if it's not, what they'll do is they'll increment the nonce again and they'll rehash everything again. So it's just a, it's just a constant for loop of rehashing and getting a number and seeing whether it satisfies the condition. And it's a competition between a lot of miners in the world. And that is why they always say Bitcoin is um, not eco-friendly. Uh, you have seen like all the mining factories in China being shut down. So all of them are basically trying to build up the best resources, the most powerful factory, so that they can always be the first one, always be the fastest in solving this hash in order to get like rewards. Yeah, so essentially that is what proof of work is. And now I'll quickly jump into what proof of stake is. Um, so proof of stake is very different and it solves the whole uh, eco-friendliness problem. So proof of stake basically depends how, how successful you are in managing to mine the block, depends on how much you actually stake it. Yeah, so uh, basically it restricts the individual mining power of, of people. So instead of how much resources you have, it depends on how much, for example, if Bitcoin is proof of stake, it depends on how much Bitcoin you are actually staking. So what I mean by staking is basically, uh, for example, I have 10 Bitcoin and I stake all 10 of it. Um, this 10 Bitcoin is sort of locked for a fixed period of time or for the period of time that I want to become a miner. And why that is important is because based on this 10 Bitcoin that I locked, this is the proportion also um, of me being selected as the one to kind of mine the next block. Um, how you can visualize this is imagine a 100 meter race, right? In Bitcoin, proof of work, what it does is that you launch the race, all 10, 10 of the participants will race all the way down the 100 meter line, and there's only going to be one winner. 
and the winner will basically get awarded like the full compensation and full reward. Um, but that is energy um, computationally expensive because all your other runners are tired. They all expanded their energy to run to try and run the 100 meter race. Um, but in proof of stake, it's slightly different. Think about it as proof of stake at the starting line before they even run. I sort of choose uh, who will be the runner, right? And this percentage is based on how much they stake or how much money they kind of put up uh, to get locked in my funds, in, in the central fund. Um, so, and then I'll choose one runner to say, oh, congratulations, you are chosen as the person who should mine the block. And this guy goes on to run the 100 meter race. So in this case, you can see how much energy is being conserved. Um, and with the many amount of miners, you know, it's always getting lesser and lesser for proof of stake versus proof of work. And so in, in the blockchain trilemma, the trilemma is always between scalability, security, and decentralization. Uh, you can imagine that to scale something bigger would mean that you need more parties to sort of agree, right? So you can imagine more computers need to store the same blockchain. Um, and that is why, and that is where you start to have security issues. Because with more computers having to get the information, there's more lag time, it's more susceptible to like a lot of hijacks, a lot of hackings and stuff like that. Um, there are a lot of blockchains that have gotten hacked uh, and they go on the news, you know, a few hundred millions and stuff like that. Um, and of course, the more decentralized something is, the less secure it gets. So um, it's always a, a balance between these three uh, that blockchain is trying to solve. Yeah, so with, with that, a very, that's a very quick rundown of what proof of work, what blockchain and proof of stake is. Um, there's a lot of details to dive into this, but you know, I want to keep this short and simple and just a quick introduction. Um, and now we'll be introducing you to Tezos and what Tezos is. Um, so Tezos is actually founded uh, back in, the testnet was launched in 2018 and the first white paper was done in 2014. Um, it's actually based in Switzerland, founded in Switzerland. And at that point in time when it launched, you know, it was the largest ICO at that point in time. And the mainnet launched subsequently in September of 2018, the same year. So it's just not too long ago uh, that we see the launch of Tezos. And some of the key features that distinguishes us from Ethereum, from Bitcoin, um, are these, can be sort of, sort of summarized into these three factors. Um, so first of all, it is a blockchain that is capable of performing protocol self-amendment via on-chain voting. I will further explain what this is. Uh, also, it is able to do smart contract formal verification. And last but not least, we talk about proof of stake and proof of work. For Tezos, um, they do liquid proof of stake, which I'll also explain later on uh, why that is important or why that is beneficial. So first of all, we talk about Tezos being a self-amending crypto ledger. Um, what this means is sort of, you can think about how Ethereum in the past few years, when blockchain wants to upgrade itself, right? It is not easy to upgrade a protocol because whatever you put on the blockchain is immutable. It's something that cannot be changed and your users are all on board that, that blockchain. And what basically the, the whole idea behind Tezos is that in, okay, sorry. So in Ethereum, for example, if I want to change a protocol, right? Like I've been always been saying that one plus one is two and that's how Ethereum has been like. And then there's new protocol that comes in that allows me to compute uh, one plus one in a faster way. For me to upgrade the current Ethereum or Bitcoin chain, what I need to do is this thing called a fork. A fork is basically like a split. Um, think about it like if you have used GitHub, uh, fork is sort of like branching. And when you branch, there's a lot of issues that can happen. Um, when you branch, your community is sort of divided. You also sort of have to shift your community to tell them, hey, this is the outdated branch. Everyone needs to hop over to the new branch that is that contains the newer version, updated version. Yeah, so, um, that's basically what forking is and how traditional blockchains upgrade their protocol. Uh, but on Tezos, what we do is we do this thing called the on-chain uh, on chain amendment, which is different from traditional blockchains, which are forking and branching out. And this basically helps to reduce, you know, the likelihood of hard forking, which can divert. You can see like there's Bitcoin and there's Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, so that was actually due to a forking that was done like very long ago uh, when Bitcoin started in the, in the first few years. Um, it also allows you to keep the community intact and also allows more rapid development and upgrades of the blockchain itself. Yeah, so how does it work is basically, uh, it goes through a certain period of time where let's say developers will come on board the blockchain and they will say, oh, I think we can try, I'm going to suggest this proposal. And then there's this proposal period 
and this is voted then between all the bakers. Um, bakers are sort of like contributors to the blockchain. So there's this exploration period where people will choose uh, one of the pro proposal to implement. And then there's this cooldown period, and then they test out the new protocol. And if and then they go through this voting system. If everyone is in favor of the new upgrade, and then we will we will proceed to upgrade that. Yeah. So um, the difference between hard fork and soft fork is this. So for a soft fork, right, your new protocol is sort of like a subset of your old protocol, which also means that uh, there is sort of no need to reject the the old software or the old branch because the old branch still sort of uh, can adjust to the new branch and accept the accept the parameters in the new branch. Whereas for a hard fork, it's sort of like a expansion out where your new rules and your new protocols are no longer covered in your old ones, and that is where you have to do a very major shift uh, of bringing your whole community on Ethereum, you know, bring it over to like Ethereum 2.0, etc., and something like that. Yeah, so that's the difference between like uh soft fork and hard fork and so for for tezos you just focus on the red box right so soft fork is basically what you see in the first one just generally look at the diagram um soft fork allows you to operate on both chains whereas for a hard fork you have to sort of go from the blue chain um all the way to the white chain because the blue chain will no longer be valid but then for tezos there's no such thing as branching out what we do is we iterate our protocols on chain and upgrade ourselves on chain yeah, so this is a very significant difference um, that kind of distinguish Tezos from other blockchains. And then we move off to liquid proof of stake. So earlier we talked about um, proof of stake, right? So proof of stake, for you to become an Ethereum miner, let's say, you have to stake a certain amount um, to become a miner. And it's not, it's not a small amount because uh, it's not a small amount because you, 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 you need a certain amount so that if you do any malicious activity, they can punish you through this thing called slashing, which means, you know, if you submit any malicious transactions to say that, oh, someone owes you 10 million, and if everyone verifies that that's a malicious transaction, they can actually cut from your stake amount. So that's why staking is important, right? Because I put 10 million there, and then when someone calls me out that I'm submitting a malicious transaction, they can deduct uh, like 10 million from my stake amount. So there's more to lose than to gain by performing any malicious activity. So liquid proof of stake basically allows you and me who are small time crypto holders, uh, maybe some of you are whales, but for small time crypto holders, it allows us to delegate our small amount of pesos to a node for them to sort of do the mining for us. Yeah, so you can think about it this way. So for example, some people might have 18,000, XTZ is Tezos, Tezos coin. So, um, some of us may have 18,000 and let's say the requirement to sort of become a baker, a baker is sort of like a miner, but in Tezos we call it bakers. Um, so if you want to, if you have only 2,000, right, you don't have enough to become a baker because you need 10,000 to become a baker. So in Tezos, you, you are able to dedicate this 2,000 to a baker and then basically the baker will make use of your 2,000 to become like a official baking note, right? And then when he gets a chance to create and mine a block, uh, you will kind of get a proportion of the baking rewards. So if he gets 10 tests as a baking reward, you will get two out of it. Yeah, so this is how in Tezos it's done. Why it's called liquid is because when you delegate your Tezos to, when you delegate your test to someone, right? Uh, you're not officially transferring money to him. You're just sort of on paper saying that, you know, I'm holding 2K, I'm delegating it to him. Now he's sort of holding my 2K on paper. But the actual money and the actual crypto coin is still in your wallet. Yeah, so that's why it's liquid in a sense, because at any point in time, you can say, no, you don't want to be part of this baker anymore because he's malicious and stuff like that. Yeah, so there are a lot of benefits to this because you are not locked into the baker. You have more incentive to call out his malicious acts. You won't scared that he take your money and run away. Yeah, so you can say that, oh, I think this guy is like submitting malicious activities. You can quickly withdraw your test and then he will get punished by the system. So there are a lot of different types of proof of stake, um, which I'll leave you guys to read. Um, yeah, it's very interesting to, to study about all these things. And next we'll move on to smart contracts. Um, so what are smart contracts? Smart contracts essentially, think about it as a piece of code that is living on the blockchain, um, similar to how you code your Python codes. 
your if and else, your conditions and your for loops. Um, a smart contract also contains a file like that, just that this is a file that is deployable to the blockchain. And once it is, once it is, once it is deployed to the blockchain, right, you can't really change it. Yeah, so basically, if you say that if your name is Sean, instead of receiving $1, you always get $5. Once you deploy that logic, you sort of can't change it anymore. And yeah, so it's irreversible after it controls the execution of everything. And that is why it is so powerful. Um, smart contracts sort of replace your third party. Think about it in a transaction wise, instead of DBS or OCBC or the banks saying that Sean transferred Brian $5, Instead, now this whole logic is governed by a smart contract. And it's so powerful because this smart contract is put online. It's available for everyone to see. There's no way you know you can tempo with the $5 to become $10, etc. There's no way of saying that he's right and he's wrong. Um, and that's why it's so powerful. Uh, yeah. And in Tezos, the low-level language that we use is called Mikkelsen. So on the right side, you can see the low-level stack. I know it looks very gibberish. Like I also don't understand what's going on. Um, but basically, this is a very low, low level programming language. Um, and this low level programming language basically allows for the second point, which I was talking about, which was smart contract formal verification. Because the act of deploying your smart contract to the blockchain is irreversible, it is very important to make sure you know you're always testing your code and make sure that in your product, in your product, sorry, in your deploy dev environment that everything is correct. And basically, because of this Mikkelsen language, um, you can very easily formally verify that all your transactions, all your operations are correct, right? Because they can just basically match that your transfer functions are written in a certain way that is required on the Tezos blockchain, and they can do the check for you. And if there's any error before you deploy, they will let you know that, oh, there's an error in this function. Uh, so that's why it's so, um, so crucial for that as well. And sorry, this is the low level language. And now we're going to go one layer above. Um, that's also where SmartPy will come in. But before Smart, before SmartPy and Python comes in, um, there's this other language, higher level language called Lego. Um, this language is actually very popular in other countries where um, Tezos is also booming, like in Switzerland, etc. There are a lot of Lego developers. And it's a very different syntax. And there's three different flavors of it. There's Pascal Lego, Camel Lego, and Reason Lego. So all these. All these different flavors kind of depend on where you come from as a developer. If you come from coding C and C sharp, or if you come from a JavaScript perspective, then you will adopt to this different legal language. Yeah, so legal is still very um, stranger to me. Um, I, I tried learning, but it's not that easy. Like SmartPy is still something that's easier. Um, and then yeah, we have the SmartPy one, which we'll be talking about today. So it is also a high level library writing language for smart contracts. And uh, basically, you can write your code in uh, Python, but we have to import this SmartPy library, which later you will get to know about in a hands-on way. Yeah. So with all this being said, um, I just want to open the floor quickly for any questions, maybe like five five minutes to see if there are any questions. Because the next part, we are going to be starting to write on our smart contract. And before that, Brian will be walking you through how to set up your Temple wallet for those who have not done so. So, yeah, any questions from the floor? I, I know it's a lot, um, yeah, but I'm just trying to sort of skim through this and intro the blockchain. Um, the main emphasis on the first part is really to share with you guys what blockchain is about, why it is so, why it is so changing in the technology field, um, and, and basically to poke your interest in blockchain and wanting to explore more, uh, and why it's such a hot topic now. Yeah, so if there's no questions from the floor, um, I think Brian will move on to get you set up with your Temple Wallet. So Temple Wallet is basically like a, a hot wallet, something like MetaMask on Solidity. Um, and this basically allows you to store tests um, on a test net and on a main net, which we will be using later on for to deploy your smart contract. Uh, so I, I think I can take the floor here. So, uh, so uh, if uh, you guys, guys you haven't, you haven't uh, uh, I, transported out the uh, 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 Mr. Good, I think uh, your audio has some echo. Uh, okay. Can you check whether your, maybe your, 
Gator Town uh, can be uh, uh, can be off first. Uh, I don't have the Gator Town on okay. actually. Okay, yeah, I think now it's not, not much better than just now. Yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, so uh, if you guys have have not installed a uh, Temple Wallet, it's actually uh, it's actually a digital wallet that holds your cryptocurrency or your in this case our Tezos. So if you can go to this thing where I will drop here. So you can download it on Chrome or Firefox or you know like the rest of the browsers if you have it. Uh, if not, uh, I would like to. I mean, like uh, if uh, I wanted to see actually who has their temple models already installed. So uh, if you can say yes on the chat, then I could see who who like the amount of people who has uh has that thing uh installed. Yeah. So okay, so. Maybe I can go through first. So you want to? I, I have for Google Chrome on my as my browser. I can install it first, and then you can just add this as an extension. So you can add this as an extension, and then you after that you can actually see that uh, after it already had been, uh, headed right. Uh, you can actually pin this onto the thing, which is you can just pin this here. You can go to your your extensions uh tab here. You can pin this here. And you want to actually create a wallet. So put in your password. And then accept the agreement and terms. And of course, uh, th th this, this is where, uh, you know, like you have your seat place and things like that. So it will like some, you will need to have a piece of paper. Uh, with that, this is your, actually it's your secret. Don't uh, try not to record it on your computer. It's, it's because uh, if someone actually, you know, uh, Hex your your com your computer or you know or, or screen hack your computer. He can actually see what you actually save in your com in your computer. So uh, it's best to to check uh to actually check the, the uh to actually to write down in a piece of physical uh, paper. And then uh, after you are done with this, right, you can actually go and key in the words to make sure that uh you have the right on the seat place and make sure that you can keep it like safe in one place. So uh while that is done, right? Uh while that is done, you can actually I'll give you the link for to get like uh Otezos on on the on the on the test net. Okay, uh so a show of hands if everybody can actually go go through this. I think it will take like a while, uh, maybe three, three to four minutes, I think. So you show hands if everybody has this inside already. Yeah. So it will look like something is like this, where you can go here. Uh, you can go here and see that this is uh, after you are done with this whole thing. You have this uh the temple wallet wallet as your address. You see, uh, I mean as as you have this thing called the temple wallet already installed here, and you already have your seat phrase and I mean like your seat phrase. On the piece of paper, so it will look like this. And this is a this is the these are the networks for what you want to do. So the Tezos, the main net is actually the main net where you actually have to deposit real uh, Tezos, which is a real is a cryptocurrency. And then if you go on to the test net, we are trying to use this test net. So if you can, right, you want to shift this to the grant the Granada on that on test net, where you can actually uh receive for free test uh like it's test uh test tests in, in order to test out your applications or to develop to develop your smart pie i mean to uh to have tests to actually to deploy a smart contract yeah uh track brief books okay so if that is done right then you want to go here and you want to have this page is, is open. Uh, so it will look like this page where you can get your free test. Uh, but I, I think afterwards we, we can walk through with uh Sean can walk through with you uh how, how to use this to actually to input into the smart contract uh smart pie uh smart pie ed editor. Uh so Brian, you can walk through them actually adding this into the temple wallet. Yeah, so what you guys do is basically you click on copy. Uh, this is basically like copying this JSON file, um, this set of text, right? And then you'll go to your Temple Wallet. If you click on your Temple Wallet on the top right of your... 
Yeah, and then yeah, I click on the icon on the your profile icon, and then if you scroll down to import account, right? You will see these options where there are a lot of different ways to import your account, right? You can import it through private key, the numeric, etc. But today we'll do it through the faucet file. So click on the faucet file and then you scroll down, you should see the faucet JSON. Yeah, so what you do is basically paste it in and then click on submit and wait. Yeah, so the reason why we do it through a lot of different blockchains will have faucet. Um, faucets are basically just for you to create like a fake account, a temporary account, and they'll give you a small amount of um, whatever it is, right? It can be Ethereum, it can be Bitcoin, depending on what blockchain you're on. Um, give you a small amount of coins or the tokens to work on so that you can do deployment because whatever you do on the blockchain requires a specific amount of tests. Yeah, so you can see Brian over here, he imported his account and you can see that he has 35,000 tests. Uh, this value is different for everyone, so it doesn't matter as long as you have a bit of tests, it's, it's good enough. Yeah, so uh, if anyone has issues with this, just sound off in the chat and then Brian will assist you from there. Um, if not, once you have all this set up, right, we should be good to go. And yeah, I will, I will, I will take over from here and jump straight into the um, smart pie coding. Yeah, so okay, so once you have that set up, right, we are gonna kind of introduce you to the whole smart pie framework. I've dropped the smart pie website on the chat, so you can refer to that if you need to. So after you click on the link. Oh, sorry, this part is hands-on, so hopefully everyone can follow along uh, so that you know it's not just all lectures and stuff like that. Uh, so if you click on the smart pie link, you'll be directed to their homepage where you sort of see a lot of different things. You can take your own time to read up about what smart pie is. There's also a very quick introduction. Some of these will probably be very familiar codes to you because they are all in Python. Um, and you can see on the left side is actually your smart pie language. And what it does is this compiler basically helps you compile it into Mikkelsen code. So remember, Mikkelsen is a low level language that allows you to do formal contract verification and stuff before putting anything out onto the blockchain. Yeah, so this smart pie library basically helps you to do that. At the bottom, you also see a lot of different examples which you can explore in your own sweet time. So today, what we will, what we will be trying to build is we are going to build a full set. Uh, so this is actually a little project that uh, I've been trying to work on in TZ APEC. Um, the idea is that we have a lot of artists trying to create NFTs on Pezos and they will need a small amount of tests to start working. Um, and so this smart contract basically will allow artists to come in and redeem a small amount of Tezos, uh, a test tokens, so that they can, you know, mint their NFT and stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who can't import, uh, Brian, maybe you want to help out, like just keep watch on the chat. So what we're going to do now is we're going to click onto this online editor. So if you click on this, you'll be brought into, give it some time to load and you'll be blocked into this. So don't create any template, just click out of it and you should be on a blank page. All right, so I will start from a blank page like this. Yeah, so um, to walk you through the tech of what we are trying to build today is we are building a false set contract which governs the redemption of an, an artist will come to your smart contract and say, I want to redeem, All right? And for you, for the artist to be redeemed, he has to be sort of added into a list of address. So if the artist um, is not in the address, he will not be able to redeem it. Yeah, so first of all, y'all can code along. Is my screen too small? I'll increase it. Yeah, so you can code along with me. So first of all, this is, imagine this as a Python editor, right? So what we will do first is we will import our SmartPy as SP. Yeah, so this is similar to any import statements that you you do. Um, if you have any questions regarding the coding part, just uh, unmute yourself because I'm not looking at the, the Google Meetings chat. Yeah, so what you do is you import SmartPy as a library. This does all the compilation and basically allows you to write uh, Mikkelsen, to compile the Mikkelsen code from Python. And then every contract will be a class by itself. So what we'll do is we'll create a class for set and we will inherit from SP contract. Yeah, so this is a very standard template code. Um, for set from SP contract basically inherits that class so that you are writing a actual contract class. And then um, like any Python class, we will define the edit, which will take in self. Okay. And over here, there's a, there's a few things that we need to do. When you initiate a class, you have to initiate the storage that you want to store. 
So we have to start thinking of what we want to store in this contract. So inside the init function, we will run the init. And over here is where we define the different things that we want to put in the storage. So first of all, <clears throat> there'll be an admin for this contract. Right, so this admin will be the one that can add artist into the contract so that artist A now can redeem and artist B cannot redeem until the, the admin or the manager sort of adds artist B into this contract. Now, so these are some of the rules that I will kind of lay out while we are coding along the contract. Um, and then next thing, we might want to track how many times a certain address. When I say address, right, it refers to the same thing as the wallet. It refers to address is basically if you click on your temple wallet on the top right, right? It's basically the, the address that you see there, the one that starts with TZ something, something, something. So that's a specific address. Yeah, so when I say artist wallet, artist address or address, it basically means that. Yeah, so you might, in this contract, you might want to keep track of how many times a specific artist has redeemed from your contract, right? So we can write something like address to count. And this address to count will basically be a mapping of address to an integer which stores how many times he has redeemed. So in this case, since we don't have anything, we'll just put it as a empty thing about um, SP map as sort of like a dictionary, right? So in Python, you have dictionary. So think of it as you have an address as the key and the value of this dictionary will be the count. Yeah, so we'll initialize it to SP map. And then you might also want to keep track. You might want to let people donate into this for set. So for example, like if Brian wants to help out the artist, he can donate 10 tests into this for set for people to use. So we might want to keep track of um, who are the addresses who donated also, so that you know you can perhaps run some giveaways, you know, like the person who donated the highest, like wins a car or something like that. So we can create another map, which is address to donation. Right, so this will store the addresses who donate. And then we will have another one which stores the for set balance. So for set balance will sort of be an integer, but because we are dealing with the token, which is test, uh, we use this thing called SP test. So you realize that everything starts with SP, right? Because at the end of the day, this code needs to compile into Mikkelsen language. And we use the SP library for a lot of things so that internally when we compile, it knows that to use these certain things from the SlapPy library to do the compilation. So we will I do a... Uh, I tried. I'm sorry. Uh, you, you, you could you increase the font size. Okay. Is it better? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, these one are commas, not, uh, this is not JavaScript, my bad. <laughs> yeah, so these are all commas. And then next one is we might want to pause, in the future, we might want to pause the for set, right? Like let's say we're doing any upgrading and stuff like that, or the website is down, we might, or there's a hacker that is exploiting your contract, you might want to be able to manually pause it. So we can do something like for set is pause. Okay, for set is open. And then at the start, let's set it to false first. So at the start, we don't want to pause the contract. Oh, sorry, at the start, we don't want to open the false set first. This will also be something that only the admin can do. right? And then the next thing is every time someone redeems, you want it to be only a fixed amount. You don't want an artist to be able to redeem everything in your false set because that will not be fair. So we can set redeem amount. And same thing, we'll use SP test. And let's say we set it to one test. So every time someone calls the redeem function, you redeem only one test. And then we can also set minimum donation, right? Which is also, let's say only one test. So anyone who donates must minimally donate one test. And then now you wanna set, um, perhaps this is optional, or some of these things are optional. You can also set the maximum redemption count per artist. So let's say every, every artist can only redeem up to three times, let's say, so I'll do this. Right, so these are more or less all the things that we need to initialize in the storage. Um, then we'll start writing the functions. Right, so the first thing we want to write is basically the function that allows us to add, to allows the allow the admin to add the artist into this list. Right, so what you want to do is every time before you write a function, you need to define this thing called SP entry point. Um, this basically tells the smart contract and compiler that this will be a function that you can call to the blockchain. Uh, so this is just a standard rule of thumb. You always start with entry points. Entry points are basically public functions for people to access. So you will do add artist, right? Uh, we are only adding, okay, add artist because we want to cater to multiple artists. 
So imagine if I have a, if the admin has a list of 10 artists, you want him to add one by one. So these are some things that you think along the way. So we'll take in self and we'll take in new artists. Right. So new artists here will be, um, this new artist here will be a list, a list of addresses. Right. And it's always good. So in SmartPy, um, it's sort of like type sensitive. Uh, you have to sort of define the type of your arguments, especially when you're opening up a function, right? This new artist, at this point in time, we don't know, we don't define it here, right? We don't say new artist is like a list or something. So in SmartPy, what we do is we do set type. And we say that this new artist will be the type of sp.t list. Okay, so uh, I'll quickly explain what this does. So we are saying that this new artist variable that is coming in will be of type list, right? So T list basically means like type list. This is how you sort of define it in SmartPy. And what this list will store are basically addresses. So that's why we have type of addresses. So this is telling the, the ID that, you know, this new artist will be a list of addresses, right? And then next thing we'll do is we want to verify. Remember I said that add artist is a function that can only be run by uh, admin. So what we do is over here, we do SP verify, right? So verify will make sure, we'll sort of do like a check. Think of it as a, like an if check, right? So we want to verify that the SP sender, sender means the person who is calling this function, right? We want to make sure that this is actually equals to the admin. So every time you want to access something from your storage, you will always do self dot data, and then you will dot something. So in this case, you can see admin refers to this address here. So we want to make sure that the address that calls this function is the admin, right? So if it's not the admin, we can say something like, uh, we can say message, right? And we will say that uh, message equals to you are not, or you can say, you can say only admin function. So something very simple like that. And then, so once you do all the check, right? Now that you know, let's say this thing will pass if let's say this is true, right? So we'll move on to the next line and we will now do a for loop. So why I say a for loop is because remember this is a list, right? So for every of the addresses in the list, we want to add it to our um, address to count net. Okay, so of course I can create another list here to say address that is eligible, but you always want to optimize your storage space on the blockchain because the more parameters I put here, right? Let's say I put address eligible, right? And I can make this into a, a list that stores the address, but this will basically increase the amount of storage space I need, which will increase the cost to deploy this smart contract onto the blockchain. Yeah, so to optimize it, we're just going to use this, right? Since address to count now is empty, what we do is basically we write a for loop and to write for loops in SmartPy, you have to make use of SP as well. So you do SP dot for each artist in new artist. Um, so I'm doing all this assuming that uh, you guys have Python language, so it should be quite easy to follow along. Um, and then we do self.data. Remember, we want to address this one, right? So self.data dot addresses, address to count, right? And we do, we put in the artist and we initialize it to zero, right? Remember this one is to store address to count, how many times they redeem. So we store it to zero. So later when we want to redeem, right? We can, later when we want to redeem, we will check uh, whether this is, uh, whether the artist is inside this map. Okay, so, sorry, I need to, uh, hold on, give me some time. Okay. So once we've done that, right, we are sort of done for this artist function, right? So we check whether it's the admin. If it's the admin, then we will add it to the blockchain list of artists to allow them to redeem. So next time, um, so now what we're going to do next is uh, we're going to do, we'll write another function. This function will be uh, to start the faucet. So remember at the start here, our faucet is actually paused, right? Our faucet is not open. So similarly, we'll do the same thing, self. This one will not take in any argument because it's just flipping a boolean. So the same thing, there are a few things that you want to try, you want to check, right? You can check, you same thing, you want to check whether the sender is data admin. Over here, I'll show you another function which is called verify equal. 
So this basically helps you to do this, but in sort of like a little form. So verify equal SP sender is admin, right? And then you can do the same thing that says only admin function. Okay, so you have that. You check whether it's the admin, and you also want to check whether the faucet is really open. Because if the faucet is really open, then you technically can't start the faucet because it's really started. Yeah, so you want to do sp.verify, right? And then over here in, in SmartPy, when you want to do like not true, actually I forgot what's the Python syntax, but in SmartPy, we do this. Yeah, so like if I do if I do this, it's basically not false, which is true, right? So we want to check that the faucet is open. So we want to check that this is basically not open, right? So if the faucet is not open, then we let them open, right? So then we'll put a message to say, if this fails, we'll say that faucet is already open, right? So there's no need to open the faucet if it's already open. And then next one, the last thing we want to check is, maybe you want to check that there's already enough tests inside the faucet for you to start. So if the faucet balance is zero, there's no point starting the faucet because no, there's no, not enough money inside to kind of start the faucet, right? So you can do SP verify, and then you can check that over here, you have your faucet balance, right? And you want to check that it's more than, and you use sp.test again, because it's a money value. So you want to check that maybe it's at least one test, right? Because each person can redeem only one test at a time. So we'll do this and we say faucet is dry, which means faucet is empty. If let's say there's two and, two and one test. Yeah. And then what you want to do after all these check passes is very simple. You just want to flip your faucet is open to true. All right. So with that, we've done with the that function. And then uh, we can just quickly write out the, the one to stop the faucet. Right, so you can actually copy some stuff here. Right, only the admin will be able to stop the faucet. And you also want to, now you want to make sure that, you know, this is open. So you remove this wavy sign here. So you can say faucet is already closed instead. Right, and then we don't care about the faucet balance because whatever it is, we should still be able to close it. So we can do this as well. Um, Okay, so this is a bit like leche, like the way I write it, because these two can technically be combined into a single function, which is called toggle faucet, let's say. So if it's false, we'll flip it to true. If it's true, we flip it to false. Uh, so that will be a better way to sort of optimize, um, sort of optimize the, the, the function here. Yeah, but I'll just write it explicitly as start and stop faucet. And then now we want to write a very important function, which is for the artist to redeem the function. So similarly, we'll start with an entry point and this will be redeemed from faucet, right? And so there are a few things we want to check, right? First of all, we want to check that the faucet is open, right? So what we can do is we can grab this here, we can paste it in. So we want to check that the faucet is open, else we can say that faucet is not, faucet is closed, right? Um, and then the next thing we want to check is that there is enough balance in the faucet for you to redeem it, right? So there's a case where you open the faucet and people have been redeeming and then there's zero tests, right? So in the blockchain, you can't sort of listen for zero and then close the, the faucet. It sort of has to be done manually unless you write a separate piece of code to always be querying the blockchain to check whether it's zero test. And then if there's zero balance, then we call this. Yeah, so that's a separate thing. So what we want to do now is we want to check that the tests have enough balance for a single redemption. So we do, we get the faucet balance, right? And we want to make sure that, remember just now we dictated that the redeem amount is one test. So we want to make sure that this is at least larger than the redeem amount, right? If not, we can say not enough in the faucet. Right, and then there are a few more things that you want to check. Um, remember this thing, this list that we created above here addresses to count and then we have to add the artist in, right? So we want to make sure that the artist is actually inside this list before he can he or she can redeem. So similarly, we can verify, right? SP sender, 
uh, remember SP sender is actually the SP sender is the one that is calling this function, right? From whichever wallet address it is. Uh, but to check whether it's inside, we can do we get the mapping count, right? And then we can do dot contains. Um, once again, I don't know whether this is a Python function. I, I think there's something along this line also in Python. Uh, so we'll do dot contains and then we do sp dot sender. Yeah, so if this sender is a key inside this dictionary that we created or mapping that we call in over here that we created, then it'll return true, right? So else we can say you are not eligible, right? And then the last thing we want to check is remember we have this max redeem count. We want to make sure that the redeem count is haven't exceeded for this specific wallet. So we do SP verify that this count, and then we similar to in Python, right? We get we get the value of this key here, right? If it exists, right? So if this line passes, it'll be inside the map, then we can retrieve it. And then we say this must be less than three. Uh, or in this case, you don't have to specify three, you can use this variable, right? So we can do self data dot max redeem count. Right? If not, we can return an error to say that you have exceeded that redeem count. Okay, so so far no issues. These are the four checks that we'll be doing before an artist tries to redeem from the faucet. Um and then now we're gonna go on to the next slide. So after all these checks go past, right? We need to sort of add them, sort of check whether they are, sort of add them to the redeem thing. So what we do is uh, we want to send tests from this contract. So in Tezos, right, every contract is sort of like a wallet. Uh, in a way, it can also store tests, right? Similar to like a wallet that you just created, you can also store tests. So the same way, if all this check passes, we will actually send. So we call SP send to transfer tests. We will send it to the sender, right? So the first argument is, uh, you can read all this in the documentation uh, in SmartPy. So earlier in the previous page, you'll see a, a link to their documentation. So we'll send it to the sender and how much we'll send it is this that we have defined, right? So redeem amount, right? And then you specify a message that you want to send this along with, in this case, we don't need to send any message. We just need to send the money. Um, and then the next thing you want to do is remember you have a faucet balance here, which you want to minus from, right? So you'll do sp dot, sorry, self dot data dot faucet balance, and you'll do minus equals to self dot data dot. Okay. So so far no issues. We send the money and we deduct it from our faucet. And then the next line we'll do is. Remember, we have our mapping over here, which is addressed to count. Um, we want to increment that, right? So that we can always check whether he, he or she has redeemed more than three times. So we do um, address to count. Uh, hi, and I think there's, there's a question from the audience. I oh, think Ms. 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 Mr. Cha. Uh, line 22. I don't know. I mean, um, I think he raised his hand. Uh, Miss Mister Chow, would would you want to say, uh, like, uh, yeah? Something? Are there any questions from the? Yeah. You can just unmute yourself. Nothing. <laughs> okay. I I I will continue first. Okay. If you have any questions, just unmute. Cause I. I'm not watching the chat. So we have sort of finished our redemption function here, right? This is all that we need to do. Um, there are a few extra things that you can add in, right? For example, in the future, maybe you want to change this amount, right? So you can write a function for that. For example, in the future, you want to change the minimum donation amount. You can also write a function for that. Of course, all these functions should only be callable from the admin. You can also change this amount, you know, and stuff like that. Um, so in this case, yeah, so for example, let's say I want to change the max redeem amount. We can do something like set redeem amount, 
right? So self, and then we will pass in the new redeem amount. Um, same thing, we have to, every time you take in an argument, you want to define the type. So new redeem amount will be sp.t new test. Okay, so what's the difference between new test and test? Right, so test basically is uh, one test is one million new tests. Uh, so um, for defining type, we will use new tests for this. And then what we will do is, once we have done that, uh, you want to make sure that, that the admin is the one calling this. So I think we have written this before. Uh, we can actually copy it here, right? This stop for set, we'll put it here. Right, make sure that this is only an admin amount function. Then once we have done both of these check, we can go on to update the new redeem amount like this. Okay, so uh, you can continue to do the other stuff, right? Like set max redeem amount, which you can change this, change this, change this. Yeah, but I'll just skip all those for now. Um, the next important function we need is to define donate to false set, right? So we will define donate to false set self. Okay, you don't have to put in an amount here of the person that is donating to the false set because every time you send uh, a transaction, every time you call a function and you send along the test with it, it's actually recorded in another function which I'll show you soon. So there's not much verification here to be done because you want to allow anyone to donate to the false set. So the only thing you want to check is remember you have a minimum donation of one test. So you just want to make sure that the person sending in sends more than one test, right? So to get the amount, like I said just now, is sp dot amount. So this will automatically retrieve um, the amount that is sent along with the with the transaction that is called to the blockchain, right? So we want to check and make sure that this is more than the minimum donation. Is the entry right? point needed? Sorry? Is the entry point needed? Oh, yes. Sorry. Correct. Thank you. So we need this entry point here as well. And we'll do a message that only, uh, sorry, less than. OK. So this is the only thing we want to verify uh, when we are donating to the faucet. Then next thing, we want to update our faucet balance after this, right? So we do faucet balance plus equals to SP dot amount. All right, and then remember now over here, we have to update this. We have this address to donation that we want to update it. Um, so this is a bit tricky because you, you sort of want to check whether the, the donor has already uploaded has already donated before, right? Because if you don't do that, then you, you'll get an error. So same thing, we can call if else using SP. So we want to check if we, we want to check if this mapping that we have contains the SP sender, contains the sender of this, right? If it does, then we do donation amount, uh, self dot name. So this is just a variable that I'm using temporarily now. So we do this, hold on, I'll, I'll explain it. Yeah, so basically we want to add on to the existing donation amount. And first of all, we check whether this person has donated before, because if he's not donated before, right, this will throw you an error, right? Because you can't find the person inside the mapping. So if the person is inside the mapping already, then the donation amount or his total donation amount will be the existing one plus the one that he just sent from this uh, transaction. Else, we'll do SP else also. Else, in this case, will mean that this is the first time that the person is donating, right? And then, so your donation amount will be equal to just the amount that he's sending in for this transaction, right? So the purpose of this if else is just to capture this donation amount. Uh, depending on whether he has donated before or he has not donated before. Then once we have that donation amount, what we can do is we can go on to uh, update the storage of blockchain to say this person has a total donation of this. Right, so uh, yeah, so, so far we have this. 
And that should be all for donate to Fawcett. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip some of the other miscellaneous functions that I've written in. <clears throat> but some of the extra functions that I've re written in are stuff like withdraw all. So just in case you have sort of remaining uh, amount in your faucet, you want a way to sort of withdraw everything and reset the faucet to zero, right? And also other different setters that you can define. Um, but I'll just keep, I think all these are sufficient for now. So, okay, so you're done with your contract, right? So now you have everything here and you're done with your contract. And what you want to do is you go on to write test cases. So in other blockchains, to write test cases, you sort of have to create a separate file, um, a JavaScript file to write your test case and import the wallets and stuff. But in SmartPy, everything can be done. <clears throat> everything can be done in this IDE. Uh, so within the class itself, what we are going to do is instead of an entry point now, we are going to do add test. Okay, so this allows you to sort of start your test case scenarios. Uh, we can give it a name. It can be sort of anything. I'll just do for set. Right, and then within this, um, we'll call this a function which is test. Okay, so this is where we start writing test scenarios. Um, but before we start writing test scenarios, <coughs> we need a few wallets to get started with, right? So we need we need like a fake admin wallet, a fake artist wallet, etc., to get started with. So we can do admin equals to sp dot test account. Right, so this is very simple, basically. This SP test account just returns you a, a fake wallet uh, with a stored amount of tests inside. And then you can just give it administrator. And then other than administrator, we can let's create a donor as well. Right, so this is the donor. And then we'll create an artist also, right, to test. So we'll do artist. Okay, so, so far we have all this set up, right? And then now we want to create our instance of this smart contract that we've written on top. Right, so this smart contract is for set. Right. Um, sorry, for this part here, one thing I forgot is remember this admin, right? It needs to be equals to address, but we haven't really defined address. Right. So this address will be something that we pass in in the constructor of the class. <clears throat> so make sure that <clears throat> make sure you add the address there. So now once we have done that, um, let's go back to the test and we want to create an instance of the smart contract. So to do that, you can do anything. I'm just going to do F. I'm going to store it in this variable called F and we're going to instantiate the false set. It's like a Python class. I remember just now we put in a construct, a, a parameter for the admin address. So in this case, this admin now refers to this example account that you set up, right? Using SmartPy. So you can do admin dot address. So this will basically pass in admin address to faucet and create an instance of it and store it in F. Then <clears throat> to create your test scenarios, we will do this thing called scenario, right? And it goes to sp dot test scenario. So this is something you have to call. You sort of create like a empty sandbox and say that this is my test scenario. And then now what you want to do is you take this faucet that you have created, right? And you want to add it into this sandbox like test, test environment. So, uh, and also in later the output on the right side, right? You'll want a way to sort of understand your test scenario as well. So in SmartPy, you can use similar to your HTMLs. You can do H1. H1 is basically heading one. So H1 is like the largest and then H2 gets smaller and smaller. So you can do sp dot you edit uh into your sorry you do this right and sp dot h1 for set contract because this is this is basically like a title of what you are gonna test right so for this case since we are testing the for set contract we'll put h1 as this and then remember we want to add this instance of the for set right the contract class that we created into the scenario so we will do scenario class equals to f. Right. So actually with this, once you have done, you can actually click on run. Um, module. Oh, sorry. This address here needs to be capital. 
Um, for those of you who wrote small caps together, you can change this to capital A. Yeah, so it's always T capital address on this. Sorry? I can't I can't hear you, right? Uh, line 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 twenty two has a has a typo. Ah uh, yeah, correct, correct. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. I was just running and it shows me the yeah. Okay, so if, if you fix all your typo, you should get this very nice uh thing on your on the right panel. You can see this is the H1 that we added, right? For set contract. And then below here basically is your deployment parameters. You can see that the balance in this, you can see the new contract, this is the address, right? Um, and the balance of it is zero. And then the storage is basically everything that you defined earlier. So you can see address to count, donation, etc. So all these were empty, right? So you can just see T value with nothing below. And you can see the admin. This admin is basically from the uh, test account here that you got, right? So, and then for set balance is zero, we initialize it to be false, right? And then you can see your max redemption count, etc. Everything is there. Um, then over here, basically below is just your, your contract, right? That you return. And so, so far, that's all we've done. We've done the deployment. We tested the deployment and it's correct. So now then we move back to writing the test scenarios, right? So we have done this. Let me just squash all of them together. So, okay. So now we'll go on to sort of write our test scenarios. So we want to make sure that when we deploy, right, all these things are correct, like what we stated. So what we can first do is we can do scenario. Same thing, now I'll use H2, right? Because this is the title that we are testing. And I'll sort of use H2 to say, what we want to do now is want to check our parameters. Right, so to check our parameters is very easy. Just now we use SP, right? In scenario, you'll do scenario.verify equal. So similar to what we have done just now with SP.verify or verify equal, now we do scenario. So there are a few things that we want to verify, right? We always want to make sure that you call your contract instance, you assess the storage, right? And then now you get from the storage admin, right? So you want to make sure that every time you deploy your contract, right? You are deploying it, the admin is the correct one. So basically you are going to your contract, you are getting admin and you, are, and you want to make sure that it's the one that you use to deploy it because this is very important, right? And also you want to do, uh, you also want to verify a few other things. Um, F dot data. You want to verify minimum donation. Make sure that it's one, All right? You want to verify. It's up to you how detailed you want this to be. Um, uh, you can check redeem amount. You want it. You set it to be one also. So make sure it's also one. And then last one I have is you can check that your for set balance, let's say, um, is zero. Right, so we can try running this now again. So once you run this, right? Uh, okay, sorry, you scroll down. You can see over here you have your H2, right? But I think because there's, there's no transactions being called, so they don't really show anything. Uh, but basically, if there are any error, let's say I change this to zero, right? And I run it again. Yeah, so you can see over here, there's an error in the scenario. Right, um, and this is basically because like the parameters are wrong. Okay, uh, but of course, yeah, let's set it to one first. Later, there'll be uh, other scenarios that I can explain to you. So once you check your parameters, you run, everything is okay. Now we want to try starting the for set, right? So we set H2 and we say start for set. Right? So this is the next text case that we want to do. And there's a few ways, there's a few things you want to test when starting the faucet, right? So remember just now in start faucet, we verified three things. First is to make sure it's from the admin, right? Second is to make sure it's really close. And last is to make sure there's enough balance. So <clears throat> when you write test cases, you want to test the negative also. You want to make sure that someone else, not the admin, cannot um, start your contract. So what we want to do, let's write another subset header. And under starting for set, we want to test a scenario where unauthorized account cannot start for set. Or you can just say not admin cannot start for set, whichever. Okay, so this is where we are going to write our first transaction to the blockchain. 
So same thing, use scenario again, right? Now we're gonna add. So think about it as you have a sandbox and you just you're just trying to add scenarios in. So we call the contract f. <clears throat> we call the function which is start for set, right? So this is a function, and then we call dot run. Okay, so then we have to pass in a few parameters. First one is who is the sender of this function, right? So previously on top you have all these, right? So for this case, since we are trying to test an unauthorized account, not being able to start the faucet, we will do um, sender equals to donor, <clears throat> right? So this should give me an error because the donor shouldn't be able to start the faucet, right? But of course, if you run this, right, you will get an error because this should not happen, right? So instead, you need to tell the ID that you are expecting this to be false. So you can do valid equals to false. Right, so if I were to run this now, you can see over here, you are testing start faucet. Um, you are testing the scenario where unauthorized account cannot start faucet. So you can see the error that this is a reverted transaction. Why? Then you can see the message that you returned earlier, right? The message that you wrote on top in your function, you have it over here. Only admin function. All right, so basically this is telling you that it's correct. You wanted this fail scenario and this fail scenario came out. So now we can go on to do a few more stuff. So the next thing we want to test is not able to start faucet without enough funds. All right. So remember just now earlier, without donations, with no balance, you cannot start the faucet. So we can do the same thing here. We want to start faucet, right? This time we want to do it from the admin wallet. Right, and also you see this as failing, right? Because there's not enough money in the faucet. So right now the error is only any function. But this time around you shouldn't be seeing this. You should be seeing another message. So let's click run again. Um, over here you can see faucet is dry, right? Which is correct, which is the error that you want. So now that we've done this, let's move on to the next few scenarios and ultimately finish up this testing contract. So let's do um, starting faucet, right? We can do H3. Uh, we can do, okay, so for me, I'm going to do a H2, right? And I'm going to do donating to faucet, right? And then I'm going to do a H3, and I'm going to say, um, same thing, I want to test, not able to donate below minimum amount. So remember, we set a minimum amount, and then we can, same thing, add a scenario. This time, we call the donate to faucet function and we call run, and the sender will be your donor address, right? And now the amount that you send in, okay, uh, there are a few ways you can do this. Remember, one, um, one test is one million mu test, right? So we can do amount equals to sp.mu test, right? So instead of one million, let's do, uh, let's do 10,000. So 10,000 will be 0. 0 0.01 test, right? And we do valid equals to false. This should fail. So same thing, you can always rerun your contracts. You can see over here the message, less than minimum donation amount. Yeah, so that's correct. So everything is going good so far. And then now the next scenario is you want it to be able to donate, right? So same thing, we're going to run this same thing. Uh, you can copy paste the same line. Just that now this thing, you can change it to, let's do 5 million. So make sure you have um, six, six zeros, correct? Huh? Six zeros. Yeah, make sure you have six zeros, right? And then you can remove this value equals to false because uh, by default it's true. Okay, so if you run this, okay, so this is the first successful transaction that you see, right? Over here, you can see able to donate. Right, and over here, the interesting thing is you can see that it shows you the state of your storage after you successfully donate. So now your contract balance is five, five tests, right? And over here, you can see address to donation, which is what you coded. So this address donated five tests, right? And your faucet balance is five tests. And of course, your faucet is now still not open and the other stuff all still remain the same. So these are all constant, right? So this is getting, we are almost there. Um, the next thing we want to test is to 
make sure that we can start the false set. Right, so we can do scenario dot h2. Now we can do a uh, success in the start for set. Right, and then we can do h3. So this basically this is up to you what you want to write. It's just to help you understand your test scenarios better. So now we are gonna same thing, add a scenario, start for set, run with the admin address. Okay, um, so of course you can run this right, and and nothing is gonna. You can run this right, and then on the right side, you will see that this happened. But you sort of want to verify that this is true. <laughs> so instead of like eyeballing and seeing that this is true, you can do what we did earlier, right? So we can do verify equal. Right. So you want to verify that the um for set is open variable. Is equals to true at this point. Sorry, true. Right, so um, you don't really get much changes in the UI, but basically now you have a statement here that will tell you that it's true. So if this is if you change this to false, <clears throat> you'll get an error, right? Because there's an error in your scenario. So you must make sure that you are as comprehensive as possible when you're writing your test case scenario. Yeah. So um, okay, there are a lot of things else to test. I will not run through everything. Basically, the next few things that you test is to make sure that you know um, the admin can add the artist, right? Someone else cannot add artists. Um, you have to check whether the artist can redeem from the faucet. You also have to check whether he can redeem more than uh, three times. Okay, so to cut it short, um, I'm not sure how much more time I have because there are still some stuff. There's still the deployment of this. So what I'm going to do is you can share your code with people by going to this share button and then click share with IPFS and generate a link. Okay, and then you have this, you can copy it. So what I'm going to do is um, I have one that is written out finished. I'm going to copy it and send it to you guys on the Google Hangouts chat. So you can take a look. You can also continue to work on it um, after the session. But right now, basically, even if you don't finish writing your test scenarios, right, you can actually, you are ready to deploy it. Okay, so uh, stay with me for a while more. We just add, we are adding like one more line of code to make sure that our deployment is correct. Okay, so next line, right, you will go out of the class, right? This is before this, after you've done everything in your smart contract, before you're going to deploy, right? You will do add compilation target. Compilation value. Okay, so what this does is basically um, it it tells this is there's test scenario and then there's deployment. So this one is basically telling you that what you want to compile your code with for the deployment uh, scenario. So what we do first, first parameter is you give it a name, right? So this can be anything for set contract, right? Next thing is your actual contract that you have coded on top. So this is your false set, right? And then over here, remember you have to pass in a admin address variable. So right now, what I need you guys to do is remember just now Brian set you up with a temple wallet, right? So what you need to do is go to the temple wallet. Um, can y'all see my temple wallet? Oh, you can't see my temple wallet. Uh, hold on. Let me just let me present my host screen. You know. Okay, uh, let me see. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, the screen is a bit huge. You'll just look at the right side. So um, you'll go to your temple wallet. Right, and then over here just now there are different nets that we're gonna work on. Um, so go down to Granada test net. Uh, click on it. Right, and then uh, you should have the wallet with a lot of money, right? The one that you got just now. Yeah, and then you can see over here you can click on this to copy the address. 
So click on it and copy to, to your address. And then over here, go back to your contract and you're going to do sp.address. And then you will put in your contract, your address like that. Yeah. Let me just make sure the closing brackets are correct. Okay, so once you're done with that, right? Um, you can run it one more time. After you run it, right, you can see over here, you click on this test, you will see false set contract, and uh, you'll see compilations and tests. So what you want to do is click on compilation, click on your false set contract, okay? So to make sure that you have clicked on the correct false set contract, right, is you go to this thing called deploy Mikkelsen contract. So right now we're going to move into how to deploy it onto the test net on Tezos. So click on deploy Mikkelsen contract, right? And then you go to storage JSON. This is like your Mikkelsen code. Just now earlier I showed in the slides. So this is what it's being compiled to. So what you want to do is check this address here. There's this TZ something something. Yeah, just make sure that this is the same as the one that you copied. Right. So if I don't if I don't add the SP compilation, right, what will happen is it will automatically use this fake admin address that I set up earlier as the false address, which is not what we want when we, we, are, we are actually deploying, right? Because then the admin will not be your wallet on Temple Wallet. Yeah. So once you have done that, right, um, double check this. Once you have double check this, right, what we can do what we can do is we click on deploy. This will bring you to another page. <clears throat> Okay, so once you're at this page, right, you will see over here, first you have to select your node and your network. Um, what are nodes? Nodes are basically providers. Think about it as you, and then there'll be a node, and then the blockchain. So the node basically helps you to communicate whatever you want to communicate to the blockchain. So in this case, we are not working on the main net. We are going to work on Granada net. That's also the net that you got your test from, right? So click on Granada net. And then now you have to load in a wallet that is going to be used to pay for the deployment. So just now, there are a lot of ways to do this, but we're going to use Temple Wallet, which we installed. So click on the Temple Wallet and then select the account that you imported earlier with the test. And then <clears throat> you should see something here different from mine. You should have a review account and activate account. Go on to click on that. Um, these are basically like confirmation for you to sort of activate your test account on the test net. Yeah. So just click on it until you see something like mine over here. Mine was already activated and reviewed. Yeah. So I'll give about one minute, one minute or so. Just click on it. After a while, you should see your balance here. Okay. <clears throat> So once you're done with that later, um, you can continue to scroll down. These are your origination parameters, which you don't have to touch anything. Um, you can click this estimate cost from RPC. You can see that when you click this, right, your gas limit will change and your storage limit will change. This basically takes your contract, um, takes your contract, calculates how much gas it needs to deploy. Gas, you can think of gas as literally like your car gas right so for example to do a one plus one it takes maybe 10 gas to do multiplication it might take more tests so depending on how complex how complicated your smart contract is it will require different amount of gas to to deploy and then your gas have different prices right like if you go to shell it's different price they are different at different point in time of the day the oil is also at different prices so your gas varies so similarly, you use you use gas multiplied by the gas price to get sort of like your fees, right? So you can see this fee in test <clears throat> is actually your gas multiplied by your gas price. So uh, I assume all of y'all have reviewed and activated your account. So now we'll go on to estimate the cost. Once you click on that once, then you can click on deploy contract. Okay. So once you click on deploy contract, this signature will come up. You don't have to do anything about it. This is basically for you to use your temple account to sign this transaction to say that you are the one um, like you are signing this transaction to the blockchain. So you click on accept. And then now your MetaMask, uh, not MetaMask, sorry, your temple wallet um, extension will pop up. 
um, for you to sign. Okay, you don't have to do anything, just click on sign. And then you should get this. <coughs> right, so you'll get contract originated successfully. And over here below, you can see block confirmations. You can see now I have one that is loaded, right? It will slowly load finish. So what block confirmations are basically is you remember just now we talked about the Byzantine problem. You have a lot of different computers around the world, right? Um, when you when you sort of submit this transaction, it goes to one computer or like the nearest computer to your house. And then this computer needs time to broadcast your transaction to all the other nodes so that they all store the same thing. So this block confirmation is more of like um, the blockchain wanting to make sure that at least like maybe 12 computers have received your transaction, then it's considered as a confirmed transaction on the blockchain. Yeah. So while this is confirming, right, what you want to do is you can copy this. So go ahead and copy your smart contract address. Okay. And then uh, Brian, help me drop the Battle Call Dev uh, Explorer. So now we'll go to this website called Battle Call Dev. What these are, these are basically explorers. We call them block explorers. It allows you to explore all the different blockchains. Right. So what you want to do is you put in the address that you have just now, and you should see this thing pop up. Right. So this is your contract address, and it says it's on Granada Testnet. There are zero transactions yet and it was deployed a minute ago. So if you click onto this, right, you should see something very nice like this. Okay, so it's called origination, which is also called deployment. So you can see how much was cost, how much your contract costed. Y'all should all probably have different amounts because at different point in time, the gas was at different prices, right? And then if you go into storage, you can see everything that's initialized as per your deployment earlier, right? So once again, double check that your admin is correct. Is the one on your Tempo wallet, okay? You can also go into code, right? But this is, there's no point looking at this. Uh, like, I don't, I also don't understand this because this is in Mikkelsen, which is a very low level language. And you can also interact with your contracts through here. Um, but we're not going to do it through here. We're going to do it on SmartPy. So just leave it at this page, right? At operations. And then let's go back to the previous step over here. Okay, then what you want to do is click on Open Explorer. This will bring up another page, right? And you can see over here, this is the contract address that you actually had earlier. And this will automatically load up the, the data that is within your contract origination. Yeah, so everything here should be correct as per what you wanted. Okay, so now we are going to, this is the point in time where we are going to interact with your blockchain. So congratulations, you have just written your first smart contract for some of you and deployed it to the Tezos testnet and it's live on the testnet basically each of you now can add each other as the artist to your own contract and then start the whole logic that you have built up so we're going to interact through SmartPy. there are all the other platforms you can interact through as well you can even create your own website that interacts with the smart contract right so you can imagine you create a very simple web page that fetches the faucet balance that has a button to say redeem from faucet and all these are basically interactions with your smart contract on blockchain. So once you've done this, um, this is what we're going to do. Over here in the new operation builder, you will see there's a drop down bar here, right? Which are basically all your functions that you created earlier. Right? So <clears throat> what we're going to do is we're going to donate to the faucet. Right? So let's donate to faucet. And then when you donate to faucet, you have to sort of specify the amount. So over here, you can see your transaction parameters. So this is in build test. So remember, we need at least 1 million. I'm going to do 10 million. Right, so you can see over here is 10 tests. So just make sure you donate more than um, the minimum that you specified in your smart contract. Okay. And then over here now, you are interacting with the smart contract, but it needs to know which wallet you are interacting from. So you can see over here, there are a few options. We're going to go to Tempo. Right, and then it says Tempo wallet is disconnected <clears throat> we'll connect it so now we're going to connect to i mean for you guys you only have the one account with dash right so we'll just connect the, we'll just connect that because in our smart contract we did not say that the admin cannot donate right so the admin can be a donor so connect to your wallet over there and then you specify your amount okay the next thing you need to do before sending the transaction is you click on build transaction parameters 
Okay, so um, what this does is basically format your transaction parameters and your account address in a way that is accepted by Nintendo smart contract. So it's all done behind the back end. So just click on it once. And then now you can click on send the transaction. After you click on send the transaction, <clears throat> you'll get a pop up over here. And you can see over here, you're trying to send 10 Tezos, 10 Tez, and then there are gas fees as well, right? A very small amount of gas fees that is required. And then just click on confirm. And then basically, they will tell you that it's sending, right, to the contract, it may take a few seconds. There are also other ways to keep track of your transactions. If you click on your Temple Wallet, and you go to Activity over here, on the most right-hand side, you'll see Activity. You can see this thing, right? You can see this thing over here that is pending. Okay, so now on our website, it really shows Applied. Right, so it shows Applied, and over here, it also shows Applied. And you can see the result is minus 10 tests for my uh, wallet. Uh -huh. So what you can do now is you go back to the other tab that I was showing you about, right? And you do a quick refresh. You will actually see this, right? So you can see a few seconds ago, someone donated to the faucet. And this is, this is not the cost. This is not how much that is donated. This is the cost of making that transaction, right? So you can, you can actually open it up. And you can see that in the storage, it's quite, it's quite neat like, because it even shows you what was changed. Right, so you can see over here what was changed, the green one, which is there's this new address that is being added to your mapping, which is address to donation. Right, so now you have a mapping of the admin address and 10 tests. Your faucet balance also went from zero tests to 10 tests. Uh, so this is basically updated on your storage. Okay, so um, this is basically in short, one of the many ways to interact with your smart contract. Um, you can also add an artist here, right? So you can add an artist and then you can choose how many artists and then basically put another address in or put one of your friend's address in and submit it. So once it's submitted, the artist will be able to come and withdraw from your faucet balance. So I think um, more or less, this is everything that we have covered um yeah it's quite it's quite interesting so for example let's try a let's try a a, ma a function where it fails right so let's give less than one test and we'll build the transaction parameters and we'll send it again so the interesting thing about smart contracts is that um you can see over here there's a warning right that it tells you that the transaction is likely to fail this is because like in in uh Temple Wallet and other of the hot wallets you have on Chrome, like MetaMask, what they do is that they simulate the transaction once um, before letting you approve. La. So basically, they'll tell you that, oh, your transaction is likely to fail. In this case, like, just reject it. You don't have to confirm it. Now, this is because um, you are donating less than the minimum amount that you set. Yeah. So um, I think that's the end of the example here. You can sort of see how um, this smart contract that we have written govern a certain set of rules. And these are very, very strict rules. Of course, we can say that it's immutable. At the same time, you can always update the storage, right? So in a sense, um, if an artist has already submitted, has already redeemed, right? His name will be there. Let's say he redeemed more than three times. As the admin, you can always write a function where you can reset three to zero. But so in some way, you can change the state of the blockchain. Um, but then if you think about it, everyone will be able to see your code. For example, everyone will be able to see over here that, oh, the death went to minus redemption count from an artist. So they know that, you know, you are doing something very fishy. And that's the interesting thing about blockchain. Like everything is transparent. Your code is transparent. <clears throat> everyone sees what's going on. So you know that there's no need for any like fishiness or suspicious behavior and stuff like that. Yeah. So. With that, I've sort of come to the end of um, uh, what I want to convey through SmartPy and Python. And in fact, Tezos is one of the few blockchains that <clears throat> allow you to code in Python. I think the other one is Algorand. Um, not really sure about it, so I uh, have to figure that out. So there is. So now that we've done this faucet, right, and you guys know uh, like the idea behind why we are creating this faucet, right? It's for artists to get their initial amount of tests, right? There's actually one thing that is very flawed. 
So as I was building this for my own project, at the end of the day, I didn't use this contract at all. Yeah, so can any do, that, do any of you find out the flaw? Like there's a loophole in this idea that I'm creating and with this smart contract. Yeah, so if any of you all know the answer as to why in the end I can't use this at all, uh, feel free to type or like uh, unmute yourself and throw out any suggestions. Oh, if you have questions, please also ask now uh, regarding smart pie. Because I believe we'll be moving into another topic soon. Um, yeah. So just one minute, if anyone knows, if anyone can find out why. <clears throat> It, it, it's not easy to see it because initially when I was writing this contract, I also thought like, oh, I, I done it. I done it already, right? I just need to create a website to, for this. But then after a while, I realized, oh shit, like this doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, there's something very fundamentally wrong with using a smart contract for four set. Yeah, hold on, I'm just gonna change my screen back to Can I see the top of the code again? Sorry? Can I see the top of the oh. code, the top section of the code? Oh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I actually sent a, I sent the link with the full code. You can actually, <clears throat> it's inside the Google Hangout chat. Yeah, you can, you can click on it actually. Um, okay. So, okay. So since no one know, right, the answer is that um, I wrote a smart contract for artists to redeem tests, right? Because they do not have tests. But remember that redeeming from the faucet was a function on my smart contract. So for the artist to even redeem from my faucet, the artists need tests to redeem from my faucet. Yeah, so that's why this whole thing was flawed. Um, I didn't see it coming as well. I built everything and then I realized that, you know, how can the artist redeem when he doesn't even have tests? to submit the transaction to the blockchain. Yeah, so that was why this whole thing was great. Uh, but I think it was still a very good learning journey for me. Um, and, and that's why I wanted to run through everything. I think a lot of fundamentals are being covered there. It's also a good way to start. You can see a lot of examples, like the calculator examples, they are all on the SmartPy website. They also have a Telegram, which is quite active. Uh, maybe Brian can share it, but if you guys have any questions encountered when you are developing on SmartPy, you can just feel free to pop in the telegram and then like um just let them know yeah they'll they'll, they'll answer it very easily so um i'm gonna go through a few more stuff back to lecture kind of stuff um hopefully you'll wrap up the coding part and there's no questions uh, whatsoever so token standards are basically if you have heard of erc721 erc20 they are basically a list of um basically a list of token standards that every contract must, adh must adhere to. For example, if you want to create the next Shiba coin, or if you want to create the next Dogecoin, um, you need to have certain set of functions <clears throat> within your smart contract for you to be even be eligible to be considered as a token. <clears throat> and that is why there are these token standards that are coming up. So in Tezos, we have FA 1.2, which are for your fungible tokens. So for those of you who don't know what is fungible tokens, Fungible tokens are basically tokens that are identical to each other. Your Bitcoin, your Ethereum. One Bitcoin is, has the same value as another Bitcoin. They are not unique to each other, and that's why they are called fungible. Um, so I'll, not, I'll just skim through this. FA 1.2 is a, just a token standard, right? And you can see these are the basic functions that need to be included, right? So for your tokens need to be able to transfer. You need to be able to get the balance, get the allowance, and get total supply. So Sorry, uh, David say something. Okay, uh, basically, yeah, so these are the things that you need to include in your contract for you to be considered as a fungible token on Tezos. And then you have non-fungible tokens, which I'm sure most of you have heard of if you've heard of blockchain, right? The whole idea of NFTs. Uh, fungible tokens means that one token will not be the same as another and they are unique to each other. They might look the same, exactly the same, but embedded in their metadata is unique IDs that dis differ them from one another. So similarly, <clears throat> you have a set of functions that you need to include in, in order for you to become uh, non-fungible uh, tokens. 
So today we will not really dive down into you know how to create NFT and stuff because it's a very long process. It's not just Python. It's it can be done in Python, JavaScript. You have to first create your art, randomize your art generatively, upload it onto a decentralized database storage to make sure that it's never going to be deleted. And then you have to write your smart contract, right? And then you have to write your minting contract. There's, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in making an NFT. So it's not something that we can cover today. Uh, but we would love to share more about NFT. Uh, and that's why I think I'll hand the time over to Brian to kind of talk to you about, now that you know what NFTs are, it's quite, it's very important to know the use case of NFT. It goes beyond just your pixelated images. It goes beyond just trading your monkeys and your apes for money. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot more use case than that. And that is why you see so many huge firms, investment firms coming into NFTs. You know, it can be Facebook and their metaverse. Um, it can be a lot of different things. So I'll leave Brian, I'll leave it to Brian to share that with you. Yeah, Brian, you can go in. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Hi, hi everybody. Really, so no. I think there's no, a no. heck oh, Sorry, sorry, my mic, my mic. Yeah, sure. No. It's fine. So like I can go through the first uh, use case uh, of a blockchain. So in one sense, uh if you know about the XC infinity hype where it started somewhere in June uh, of this year, where you know a token price was less than a dollar that and then you have, have rocket all the way to 120 bucks. And it's like a, you know, it's a game that is a play to earn game where you actually uh, you breed this thing called a uh, XC. It's like an animal that actually helps you to generate uh in income. So it, when you create this kind of, of animals, you have to generate for income in terms of the cryptocurrency called SLP. So in one sense, uh, a lot of people in Saudi Asia are doing it, especially in the Philippines. So that there's a lot of use cases in this kind of games that has has have rocketed since like a few months ago and, and this is just one is just one of the famous one then of course you in in the gaming i mean like it's still part of gaming if you think about like uh if you if you understand like in the past uh, there are physical cards you know like for pokemon cards like there's like a charlie card that is very expensive and things like that uh now in this case you can use blockchain the technology to actually uh to use to de develop uh, uh uh for for trading cards to actually to trade with other happy people or issue out this kind of trading cards so it means that it's, it's like it's verified and then you have a source a, a way of like a source that uh you can verify where you know which which uh which guy will actually issue out all these kind of cards so it gives some kind of value to these cards and uh, of course in terms of collectibles there's there's also like uh if you if you read about the news the like the recent news on on disney uh like mra for disney trying to release the star wars and marvel kind of collectibles a lot of these use cases like they have this kind of r2d2 or, or c3po and Kennedy that's all around and these are actually being um, like being developed in the space in in even in the industry as like as people are trying to come into the, the new space and yeah so that's like part of like the gaming and the collectibles part so now you if you go on to other like general use cases let's say you want to go to a concert uh, you know in the past you want to you need to buy from from cisco and get like uh, the tickets and things like that like if people uh, tickets or you know or they need to print out through that but there is no way to properly like for verify if uh you know if if it's like a if it's a fake it's a ticket or like a, a counterfeit so with this kind of blockchain you know like technology allows you to actually uh to actually to source out uh like to source out uh, where uh how like it's in a way it helps to prevent all this kind of, of counterfeiting where you can use this technology to check if this is uh, actually on the proper issuance uh that is appearing on the blockchain so this is one of the examples uh. and of course uh you know the last part will be like or well, this will be more towards in the future where you know, uh, for real estate, you might actually own a part of a share in the real estate. So some, for some of these are uh, basically NFTs that uh, you, you can own as part of the real estate. And this is still very experimental at this stage, but perhaps in the next five or 10 years, all these things will actually come back. You don't need a middleman to do it. So, you know, in, in the past, you you have like for property agents and things like that. Now with the blockchain, you can just do it from, from peer to peer. So let's say I want to buy 
I'm a buyer of a property, I just can buy from so like I can buy from seller instead. So so some of these kind of use cases are here. Yeah, and um it and the last point would be actually on, on, on finance, which actually is a big part of a blockchain where you know uh for blockchain they try to, to replicate a lot of services that are uh, that are, are offered in banks and they are uh, they are in terms like uh, in terms of loans and and things like that like loans and bonds and things and you can actually uh create all these kind of applications on the blockchain and do things like uh like like what i see here for d5 decentralized openings that can actually help you to the function like it's like the bank yeah So uh, there are many other ways that you, you can think of what this NFT can be used for. It can be in a, it's a personal health data where you can store all of it in a, on the blockchain. And you know, like the drivers wrote uh, on the data where you can also check uh, what kind of records. A lot of it are mostly transactions or records on the blockchain where you cannot like so-called, uh, you know, you cannot go and, and tamper with the whole data and things like that. So. So now we go on to blockchains for, for NFTs. So um, I think I was, uh, most of the Ethereum one I'll skip, but if you know about Ethereum, uh, you, you know that they have uh, open seas on the market. So all these are NFT marketplaces that you can actually interact and buy all your art for, for pieces or, you know, or, or, or NFTs in general. So uh, this is one of the biggest, uh, this is the biggest uh, NFT for marketplaces. And, and some of it are like uh, like some of these are actually applications that are being de uh, on, on developed on our rival on, on for, for blockchains uh, but the but and, and the issue is uh ethereum has very high gas fees so if you want to like let's say you want to actually create the nft it takes you maybe about three thousand for dollars to actually make it and things like that because of the gas fees it really makes it very very expensive to to actually mean uh, an nft on ethereum and, and and some of these are, are other for market traders on other kinds of blockchain so there's there's a lot of work being done in terms of of, of, of or you know in terms of developing the, the nft space on on the blockchain itself so for, for us we have our own kind of of tattles, uh, nft uh so if you can see here these are some examples of what we have on the market places so in one sense, you can actually mean an uh, NFT on some of these uh, marketplaces. And of course, it will cost you a bit, like it will cost you less less than a dollar to actually mean this kind of, of uh, NFTs. Uh, maybe afterwards, I can, I can show you uh, a bit more how to actually mean an NFT, but some of these are projects. So this is actually a project on Tezos that um, that was developed as a, as like an uh, NFT, like the generative art that uh, allows you to uh, sell uh, this NFTs on the Tezos marketplaces. So each one is fetching at least like 700 tests, which is quite a lot of money. And, and some of the things is like, like and, and some of these things are like uh, up for people to actually uh, to upload their art pieces to sell for artists to upload their, their art pieces and to sell on the blockchain. So you can see here uh, for Calamine is another marketplace which, uh, which artists are trying to mean their NFT and trying to sell it through either options or drops or or other kinds of or functions that you have on the N nft and the NFT, nft marketplace so why 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 is Tezos in one sense what what difference should us from the other uh other for blockchains like ethereum or ethereum or so or solana is because we have quite low trajectory and because of like what we what, what sean has covered in the earlier uh, part of the class it will be on the on-chain on the government where upgrades are always constantly being upgraded to the the Tezos ecosystem where things are like are getting more efficient more cost efficient or more uh more cost efficient and upgrades are being developed so you won't have like uh you won't have to like slow down on ethereum if you ever read about ethereum's kind of upgrades it takes like quite a, a, a number of years to actually reach to that kind of consensus to actually upgrade the entire protocol and yeah and like some of the use cases in the future now will, it will be like uh if you can use nfts as a way to actually uh earn a rewards or to to farm a reward so a lot of these cases are being done uh across in the space really like uh yeah, yeah this kind of projects uh like for cyber it's like a uh, ape that allows you to breed more apes and then 
those apes will actually give you some kind of bananas to actually sell on the marketplace. And those kind, if I'm not wrong, those bananas are like uh, close to 3,000 3, bucks and things like that. So uh, then the next part will be actually, uh, it's more important that, uh, you know, like this thing called a decentralized autonomous uh, organization where uh, you can actually uh, try to set up this kind of organizations to actually uh, to have a preset of rules. It can be in terms of any set of rules that you can say, let's just say an artist, he wants to actually invest in a certain piece of art. Uh, they can set up this organization that allows like many different people to participate in it and uh and then invest in you know invest or do the development work on things uh on nfts and things like that and of course like the the last part why it's uh now the nft space is so big will be actually on the membership part where if you think about uh you know there are crypto punks if you heard of them they are, are selling for maybe one to five million bucks for for one of them and like bought it which is about 300k averagely so a lot of these are actually tied to like some kind of exclusive on the on for, for membership where happy people would think it's, it's valuable and you know they are part of the of a thriving club and and com and committee where they have exclusive events exclusive for meetups and things like that so some some of these things are being uh assessed and being uh done in the real world now and i think in the future there'll be a lot more use use cases as well and and then of course uh you also have the metaverse where you can actually use when you when you actually mean an nft you when you actually create uh the uh, your nfts on the blockchain you in the future you also can use them in terms of if it's an art piece right you can also put them in a virtual or another gallery or you know or in, in terms of art uh, art gallery a virtual gallery where it can be used and seen by everybody on who actually interacts with it so uh okay then the last part will be on developer re resources uh, which is uh this and, and these are some of the resources that we have on tezos that could uh that will introduce you more towards like uh uh like the like the, the basics of blockchain like in it, it can go from smart contracts all the way to uh the the uh to the developing your own application your work uh, your web application or on tezos itself so uh, some some of these are examples of what you you uh you can actually find uh guides or resources uh, to actually help yourself uh. and this is more towards uh, how ecosystem works in, in tezos uh where you know uh, we have our tezos foundation where it's, it's it will support us uh, and then you have your own developmental teams, which are mostly the developers who create like your wallets, your protocols, your applications. And then uh, you have the rest of the people like your coin exchanges and your documentation, which is what, which is what I just I showed you about. So in one sense, uh, this this whole thing is actually like a network. Uh, like a network. Uh, uh, it's a network where you need all kinds of people around in the Tezos ecosystem to to uh to actually to make it is, is valuable which is what we, we currently have and yeah and yeah i think that's 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 all for my presentation on on the tezos uh the workshop so it's more on, on towards like uh like what we just have covered we have covered uh we covered like the introduction of the blockchain the introduction to Tezos and we went through your you know like the workshop for smart pie and now it's like the last part will be on the nfts i i think we only have, i don't think we have time to win the nfts now but uh yeah um so if you have any more questions or inquiries in the future you can actually uh, uh you can actually text us or send us an email and you know we can get back on, on to you or what you know like in terms of ideas or creation or, or things like it's, it's, it's like that uh for example we can we can try to uh, give you some uh guidance on how to go around into the ecosystem uh, as well thank you uh thanks very much uh are, are there any questions from uh from the teachers or maybe i i can start first okay so so uh when you just now we, we we wrote a smart contract and we deployed it onto a 
as net, right? But uh, when we are to deploy on the main net, apart from choosing the main net network and paying real money, uh, is there any differences? Are, are there any differences? Uh, no. So exactly how you will write, uh, imagine if you are creating a website, right? How you interact with the test net is exactly how you interact with the main net. All you have to do is just literally change the parameters to, to basically point, you know, point it to the main net contract instead of the test net contract. Yeah, so it's it's exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So so um about the front end, right? Uh Tesla has this uh Taquito thing. Yes, correct. Yeah. So so how how uh, how 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 does this thing work? Uh, how does this fit in with the uh, with the back end? Yeah. Yes, um so you you can imagine that um hold on, let me just share my screen. Yeah, so if you take a look at Takito. <clears throat> so basically, Takito is a library that is built for you to create, um, they call it DEPs, which is decentralized apps, um, for you to interact with uh, the blockchain. So for example, just now you were interacting through SmartPy, right? The SmartPy ID. So at the back end of SmartPy ID, there's a lot of things going on when you're clicking send transactions and stuff like that. So Takito basically allows you to to do all this from your website. Yeah, so you can take a look at some of the boilerplates that is being done. Um, you can look at this smart contract interaction. Um, so you can see over here, for example, if you wrote a contract that has this increment function, right? So this is basically how you do it in code. Let's say you're writing a JavaScript app and then you have a button that wants to add um, plus one or wants to add a certain value to your storage on the smart contract, right? So what you need to do is basically you import Takito in and then when you click on the button, right, on click, you call the library, you put in the contract address, just now the one that you deployed to, and then basically you sort of format your query, take the contract, find the methods, and one of the methods is increment, right, and you pass in a value here, right? So these are basically ways that you can call and interact with the uh, blockchain. Yeah, so it, because it doesn't make sense for like the way you interacted with SmartPy just now was a very simplified way to quick to sort of allow you to have a taste of uh, what functions you call, what will happen after you call those functions. But when you're creating a real website, you will not go through SmartPy to sort of, you will not go through the SmartPy interface to interact with your contract. Instead, you go through with like a set of codes. Yeah. Okay, so so, so um, is is JavaScript uh something that we is um uh something that we, that we ideally should know before we start on Tapito or what, uh, what should we have? Yeah. I I would say I would say yes. So far, Tapito examples are all in JavaScript and TypeScript. Um, but at the same time, those are not necessary. It depends on the scope of what you are trying to teach. So. If you're trying to teach students to sort of create like a full-fledged decentralized application, then yes, like being a just develop just developing a smart contract itself is not enough. So, like for a blockchain developer, you kind of need to know how to make a smart contract. You need to know your front end tools as well. Whether is it React, Vue, Angular, a lot of different tools built on JavaScript that you can use for front end. Um, and then sometimes you kind of have need to know back end as well. So it's a bit like a full stack role to finish building an entire product. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So so actually, uh, is there any um uh real like for example uh, NFT market on the test net rather than on the main net for people uh, to test? Not that I know of on Tezos, Brian. Do you know any? So 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 when people develop uh, NFT systems, they directly do it on the main net. Uh no. So. I mean, if you're talking about Tezos, uh, I, I don't think I know of any test net, but for, for example, OpenSea, right? Yep. You can actually, hold on, uh, just, yeah, so for, for OpenSea, you do have a test net, uh, market this. Okay. This, this sort of depends on the developer team for OpenSea, right? So for example, if the marketplace wants to be a, kind of inclusive of a testnet environment so that to sort of encourage more developers to use their marketplace, then they will put in the effort to sort of create 
uh, a testnet environment for their marketplace. Yeah, so it's all entirely up to like the developers of all these applications, what they want, how inclusive they want to be, how developer centric they want to cater their app to be. Okay, thanks. So, so apart from uh, TZ and Tech, um, uh, how, how's the uh, developer community for Tezos in Singapore? So the developer community in Tezos, um, actually prior to this, we've already held a workshop with NUS, SMU and NTU as well. Um, there's also sort of like, a, I think Brian will probably know more, but there's sort of yeah. like a developer hub that are like sparking up throughout the world, like some in Switzerland as well. And to me, like because I'm quite new to Tezos as well, like three to four months, I would say that it's as, as much as compared to Ethereum, right? You can't really Google everything because uh, I wouldn't like Ethereum is still way, way stronger in terms of the amount of developers that are building on it. So when you Google for something in Ethereum, you will easily find an answer and a solution there. Uh, but for Tezos, similarly, you get you get a bit of that. But at the same time, the community is more, I would say, more knitted together. Like if you go to the Telegram smart pie, you ask the questions, you know, like there are, there are a lot of people over there willing to answer your questions and support you. There's Takito telegrams, there's smart pie telegrams. There's a lot of different dedicated channels and platforms for you to get your answer, your answers, uh, your queries answered. Yeah, uh, so like I can give you like the list of what kind of telegram groups you can actually join. A lot of these developers are like, you know, uh, they will actually help, help you a lot. And I think they, they are quite uh, responsive in terms of, uh, you know, of how fast they can answer your questions. Well, of course, because for you know, you know, as much as has been because Ethereum also it started way earlier than the us as well. So it started in two thousand and fourteen as their main currency or fifteen as their main currency. So it means that you know you you they have they already had like the the early mobile at advantage where a lot of developers are on their side already. But uh, in one sense, uh, you can actually see in the space that it's not just. On Ethereum itself, but there's uh, other kinds of blockchain like like Tezos and 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 the others that also have like developers that are trying to you know are trying to fix like the issues of of what uh, is going on in Ethereum. Like let's say it's expensive to mean NFTs on Ethereum. It's very expensive to mean NFTs on Ethereum and things like that. And I think like in that case, uh, we already have a big. I mean, we have kind of a developer community. Who, all over the world is more towards that. So we have like what I show you, no nomadic labs. It's actually part of our de developer committee where they are part of the upgrades for the Tezos on protocol itself. So like for example, and, and these are like and, and examples of what is going on in the ecosystem in our system as well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, any any questions from anyone? Yeah, I have one. Sure. So, okay, so with all this hype about blockchains and stuff like that, and how finance uh, is uh, really, how Singapore is really pushing into this area, right? So, uh, the, the the way I think about blockchains are that they are, they are, they are a distributed uh, way of uh, finance. How does that uh, work for the banking industry, which is traditionally, uh, you know, um, centralized? So are uh, the banks also like uh, taking uh, blockchains up in, in their own industry? Okay, okay, I answer for that. Um, the banks are creating their own coins. You know, if you heard of JP Morgan coin and things like that, they are, I think they are, they are understanding on the fact that blockchains have a big growth rate or you know, they are being dominated by blockchain because uh, and, you can see them trying try to actually try to open up their own their protocol and try to compete. But the difference is because one is centralized and one is decentralized. Uh, you are still uh, in the bank, it's still closed up. It's still like, you know, like you have protocols that are inside the bank. They will not share with you codes. They're not open source. You will not know what they're actually trying to build. And then uh, they might be in the, some sense, I, I wouldn't say it's slower, but like uh, it's limited in their kind of people capacity is because they are closed source. I mean, they are, they are closed source. And well, you know, this, the, a decentralized a blockchain is kind of open source where everybody can actually, uh, you know, can use on your code to try to create more applications. And and then on, they can innovate it there, it's, it's further. So that, that will be actually, 
in one sense, the, the differences in two of the blockchain, one is a, a centralized blockchain and one is a decentralized blockchain. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like, uh, as a network for, like, for Tezos and other for blockchains, uh, it depends on how many users are there. Is it an open kind of network where anybody can actually buy all these coins and then they can, they can develop on this on the platform. And, of course, it's, un uh, it's still unregulated at, at this time, so there's a lot of danger as well. But in one sense, uh, you have you have still a lot of good uh, good developers and good for, for protocols that are developing on this to actually uh, to have solutions for normal or the normal uh, for people to actually to interact with. Yeah. Okay, uh, what's the difference between a hot wallet and a cold wallet? Okay, um, so you have you have like you have the temple wallet, which is I believe is a hot wallet where you know uh, you will store you will store your seed phrases on a digital wallet. Uh. I mean, both of them are digital wallets. It's just that one one of them uh, uh the temple wallet is a hot wallet where uh if if your like let's say if your computer get it, it get it's not it's not as safe as what it is. It means that if your computer get hacked, you still can actually uh lose your seat phrase and things like that. Whereas in a wallet is usually by is via a hardware for wallet like a ledger or a, 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 a trezos where you are you when you interact with smart con, smart contracts on the blockchain, you actually you need to manually go and, and sign it uh, and try to sign it there. So it gives you that kind of the extra layer of protection in terms of security is because you actually need a physical device to actually interact with any transactions you uh, any con contract you actually initiated thanks okay uh, yeah thanks okay uh so actually uh, uh this session the, the tesla spot is supposed to end by 4 45 so so we are actually uh, a little early but doesn't matter. Uh, I, I just want to find out whether anyone has any uh, problem uh, in in Gather Town or uh, uh, whether you face any, any technical technical issue. Um, because uh, I was thinking whether we can take a break and then you take this time to uh, interact with uh, other people uh, other than myself <laughs> and 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 Tezos people. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, if it's okay, uh, then we we can actually start uh, the calendar of event sharing back in Gather Town at around uh, maybe uh, four four forty. Yeah. So 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 in the meantime, yeah, that, that just take if you may want to take a bio break or so. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks. So uh, see you. So if that will be the. So we'll be taking our leave, right? Is it like me and uh, Brian? It's, it's, it's up to you. Uh, it, it, ah, okay. Like, um, if people want to interact with you, yeah. So okay. we actually have time to do the, the mean and NFT, is it? So uh, there's it, 20 more uh, minutes. The session is uh, until uh, 4.45. Yeah, I don't know whether mm. uh, that, that will leave enough time for that. Okay, Uh, I think we can go through it short, shortly. I mean, you just want to mean a simple nft on the, the marketplace i can show you that now uh okay. let me just give me some time first uh okay i think while, while brian is, while brian is setting up uh i think like some some sort of like words for me as a developer it's it's more of um i think it's very important that blockchain <laughs> does not just become like a, a buzzword um, especially like how we have seen ai has became a buzzword in the past few years um, every hackathon you go to, every project will throw in the word AI, um, and and they just throw it because, like it's a buzzword, you know what I mean. And then now it's slowly shifting into blockchain. Uh, why I say that is because like as at TZ APEC, we actually take on a lot of different projects from different companies, and like it's it's surprising like sometimes even large companies with huge branding they come to us and they tell us about their use case of blockchain, and what they plan to do. And and the question like I always ask them is like. What is, what is the difference from just using a normal database, um, like your Firebase, your MongoDB? So there has to be, it's, it's important to differentiate like the use case of uh, 
blockchain and, and to make sure that the blockchain is really adding value to what you're trying to create instead of it just replacing your traditional storage just because it is blockchain and it's like the in thing now. Yeah, so, so it's very important to always go back to the question and ask like, why, why blockchain? Like, why do you want to use blockchain for your messenger app? Why do you want to use blockchain for your ticketing app? So I think this question needs to be asked um, whether is it like student projects or is it company projects? I think it's very important to ask this question before diving into just, you know, implementing the blockchain and then further down the road realize that there's actually no need for this. Yeah, I, I think even myself, sometimes when I when I work on projects, I look back and I realize like, what the heck, I could have just, <laughs> I could just did a very simple like database, but yeah, like the point of blockchain isn't there anymore. Yeah, so. Yeah, those are just like probably some wrap up words from me from a developer point of view. I think it's also important that students think about this um, when they when they code different projects and stuff like that. So, okay, Brian, you can go ahead. Thanks. Thanks. You are muted, Brian. Hello. Uh, hi. You all can hear me, right? Yeah. Okay. Um. Mm, okay. So, uh, to start off with, uh, how do you mean the NFT? So, what you want to know is, uh, there are market places. Uh, there are market places. Uh, on Telos, have one of them is actually Ob uh, Jacketty. So there are actually a few of them. So we actually have Hand as well. So it's actually another mar market place that uh, like you can mean your NFT. So you like the usually uh, if you want to mean uh, an nft uh we will always we will go to this place to, to mean it because it has the function so uh if you want to mean uh, the uh, uh, nft is like this you can actually see that uh i'm just going to mean now on the real net just with a simple uh, a screenshot of a google search so if let's say i want to mean 10, 10 pieces of the same nft and then you know all these are like uh, you have your title you have your description, uh, whichever you, you want to call it. Uh, let's say it's a test, test for Google images or things like that. And then you have text that you can, you know, uh, text, text are usually text that you can search on the, the marketplace where it can take you to a certain artist, a certain art piece, or a certain genre of, of what you want to search for in the marketplace. And additionally, there's a more of, of, of NFTs you want to mean at one go. So you can do, you can do this. Uh, I think the, the royalties is like part of a, like the royalties are like uh basically are royalties where uh, artists will, will receive once uh, NFT is uh is being sold or it's being conducted in a trade. So this artist who means this for NFT now, he will get some part of the like uh, about ten or percent of the royalties. Uh, in this case, uh, when someone sells the the image for a certain amount of of tests, yeah. So you can go here. And you, you can actually see that uh if I want to upload a certain let's say it's a JPEG, it can be any kind of JPEG, it can be a a wave file, can be a MP3 file as well. So it can be a lot of things. It can not so it's not just a JPEG, it can be uh yeah, it can be a GIF as well, you know, GIF like memes and things like that. You can also do all those as as what you can see. And then you can actually mean this on the Tezos ecosystem, I mean like on the on hand itself, which is um which is a very it's a simple way to actually mean for NFTs, and then you can actually see I'm gonna mean mean this ah uh, yeah so I'm preparing my obey uh this is an object which is actually a, a, a NFT uh, yeah so I can see uh it causes uh this amount to mean which is not too expensive if you think about it because it's only less than a dollar it's only forty seven cents in USD yeah so I just have to confirm it. Then you can see if you look at this i opened the transaction in the blockchain explorer so a blockchain explorer is where you can build all your transactions here it will take like as what uh, like uh sean has already explained you know the block com confirmations it will take some time to uh to get to the state where you can actually see it out. so this is the operation on it uh let me just see Yeah, 
so you can see as well in your wallet how uh, in, it got uh, interacted with and now i think it's really it got minted and things like that so how do you see the the nft right is that it's really stored on the blockchain itself so uh as long as the marketplace has the function to build it right you can actually see so now you are, i'm on pen right i can i can actually build my my assets or my creations here so this is like one of the marketplaces like it has certain kind of functions that allows you to do has certain things so like I mean, on on all these are things that I have created, like uh, in terms of uh, because if you if you know about like if uh, at the time when I introduced you about the workshops uh about this uh, about on, on myself, I actually conduct workshops and, and hackathons. So, so you know you have things that you can actually create all these kind of uh sets and things like that. So on the blockchain itself, and then I think this is the one that I I mean I think I created. So it can be just a JPEG. So how do you like you can create an art piece or a jpeg so you can just say that this is the art piece right you can just say that then you have 10 uh, so this is the one i just created so this is the object that i just created it's tied to a certain tag which is the the, the number and this is actually on one of the nft marketplaces uh, and you can actually build the meta uh, data here as well so you can see that this is stored on the blockchain itself and if i go to another the, the marketplace so you know, hand is one of the marketplaces that you see here. So this is not the same as the one I'm going to show you. Uh, so this is object.com. Uh, it's another kind of uh, marketplace where you can actually uh, also see and sell your your NFT. Uh, let, let me just sync my own wallet first to show you that uh, despite it being on an, another marketplace, you still can see your you still can see your your NFT that you just done yeah maybe just give me a moment yeah so this is what i created so you can see here this is the same one that i just i showed you here as well so you can you know you can you can sell it away or 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 send to people as well so these these are, are something things that you can do on the nft marketplace so uh if you look at like uh the list of things here I can go to a certain hall of, of artists to see what she or he has as a collection. And you can actually see that, uh, you know, like things are being sold. So this art piece is being sold for this, this amount and how, and you know, like how, how many editions that you can actually buy for. So some, some of these are functions of a marketplace where, you know, you have a list of, list of people who already own the art piece and they want to sell it away. Yeah. So this is like a first creation of, of an NFT uh, that you can actually create. It's a, it's a simple way. You don't need to de develop any application for it and you can just create this. And it, you know, you also can in, in OBJ, it's OBJJKT is actually a, like there are a de developers be, be behind it who actually improve like their applications. So they, for every month or, you know, or every month or so they would like try to upgrade their own application you know upgrade more have features and things like that so uh in one sense you you can say that uh you can say that as long as you mean or create for something like an entity on the on the blockchain itself it will not die off so you still as long as there are market places that can um that can support uh like the meta the meta data on the blockchain itself uh you can rest sure that it will not get lost because um uh, and, and that's probably that's probably the power of the blockchain itself because uh yeah because uh you you can safely say that no one application uh, controls your your so-called your art piece so if you create one you won't get lost you, even though if let's just say if this guy uh he, he closes down right you still have your art piece that you still can sell to other people on another uh, marketplace which is here yeah so that's one of the things that you you can do on you know you can do on the tezos ecosystem and i suspect why they don't have a testnet is because it's really cheap enough to mean a uh, nft on on tezos itself if you mean like 10 eh, about 10 that that i show you right uh it only costs like 0 0.49 for four, four seven usd to mean these 10 additions and i think like the max you can mean is about 2000 or 3000 you, you at one go so yeah so that's one example of it uh, yeah uh yeah yeah if you're interested you can actually read more to on towards them uh they actually have like 
they have option uh spaces like uh you can you can see the options or the listings yeah it's their own for protocol that they got own it's their own things uh, yeah so you can see sales and everything here yeah you can see what are people trying to buy and sell some of these are examples uh, yeah okay i think that's about all i can say yeah any questions <laughs> So, so uh, NFT minted on uh, Tensor's uh, is also com compatible with uh, other networks, or is there any? If I, for example, look at a uh, uh, Twitter avatar, right, which is uh, let's say an N NFT, right? And I'm, am I uh, able to see uh, that oh, this belongs to a particular blockchain NFT? Uh, so, hmm. so to answer that question, uh, right now. Um, I think they call this like interoperability, which yep. is like um, how how information can be shared within blockchains. Um, and this is something that the whole blockchain industry is still struggling with, being able to bring information from one blockchain to another. Um, so what you mean on Tezos will not be visible on OpenSea, let's say, which is mainly based on Ethereum. Um, but you also start to see different blockchains coming up with this thing called bridges. Um, that allows you to bridge your NFT from one blockchain to another. So for example, between Solana and Ethereum, um, there are a lot of different small projects working on creating a bridge to bring uh, to be able to migrate you know, NFT. Because the reason for that is that minting on minting on Ethereum is so expensive, right? That all these competitive competitor blockchains are coming up to say that, oh, look at my blockchain, I'm better than Ethereum. Like come over and use my marketplace. Um, and I will safely say that Tezos is one of them that are that is competing. Um, but at the same time, there is so much value already going on in Ethereum and on OpenSea, right? You have your crypto punks that are there. You have your BAYCs that are there. They are worth like hundreds and thousands of dollars. So it's very sticky. Like people are very sticky to Ethereum and all these other blockchains that are coming up. They are trying to make it easy to to transit from Ethereum over to their blockchain, right? To get a share of the consumers, to get a share of the market. Um, and, and that's why I think this whole idea of like bridging between NFTs are still is still something that is very new and a lot of blockchains are still trying to figure out. Um, for your point on Twitter, Twitter themselves actually made an announcement that they are going to implement uh, NFT verification for profile pictures, right? Because for example, if I own a crypto pump and you screenshot my profile picture and you use it as your Twitter profile picture, what is going to separate someone from thinking that you are the owner instead of I am the owner? So um, Twitter is actually building their own sort of verification for NFTs. In a way, you probably get like maybe an extra blue tick or something to sort of verify that, you know, this guy is indeed the holder of the NFT profile picture that he or she is seeing. Yeah, so I think a lot of uh, companies and platforms, not just blockchain platforms, like social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, they are already implementing measures to sort of you know, counter some of these issues about replication or on of NFTs. Okay, yeah, sure. So, so if okay. I if I do bring the uh, Ethereum to uh to Tezos, uh, do I have to pay the Ethereum gas fee? Right now, there's no right now there's no um Ethereum to Tezos. Bridge. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but, but typically from one bridge to another, I, I still have to incur a one time gas fee. Uh, typically for one bridge to another, yes, you have to incur a gas fees because uh, basically what you do when you are bridging, uh, more or less, yeah, for example, if I have 10 USD, right, um, and I want to bridge it to, let's say, uh, Singapore dollars. So if I want to bridge Singapore dollars to USD, what I'm basically doing is I'm going to the money changer, I'm putting in 10 SGD, and then he will give me $10 SGD worth of USD, right? So you can think of the money changer as sort of like the bridge um, and he's basically storing your asset from one blockchain and then replicating the asset on another blockchain back for you. Um, and this itself contains two transfers, right? So you transferring to the money changer and the money changer transferring from his USD over to you. So these transfers will incur fees as well. Yeah. So this is a very simple example, but of course, a lot more complex operations goes on behind the, the blockchain. Okay, sure. Thanks very much. Uh, any questions from the rest? 
I have a question. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, we know that the NFT market is a very hot uh, market right now, uh, but uh, clearly I can't just mean something and tomorrow it becomes 50,000. Uh, how, uh, how, do, how does an NFT uh, become valuable in that sense? So for an, for an NFT to become valuable, it depends on a lot of things. Um, an NFT can branch out into a lot of different sectors. Like for example, some of the use cases that Brian shared, right? Some are made for gaming, some are made as a membership. Um, and at the end of the day, I believe how high your NFT can fetch for depends on a very few fundamental factors, which is, of course, first of all, if you are a very popular artist, you can imagine if you are someone who drew, you're an artist for Disney, right? And you're retired and you sort of launch your own NFT. You can imagine that popping off. Um, imagine you're a singer, right? For example, if you are like someone from Blackpink and then you start your own NFT or even BTS right now, they are looking to launch their NFT collections. Um, so they are building on their current fan base to tap on, to leverage on that. Um, of course, at the end of the day, there are also NFTs that are built anonymously that became popular and have a very high price. Um, the reasons for that is because they constantly build utility for their NFTs. Um, and utility can come in a lot of different ways. For example, um, like holding a crypto punk is now sort of, gives you sort of like a social status. Right, it's no longer just a JPEG image. Like people actually recognize crypto punks, and that is why, like a few months ago, you see Visa buying a crypto punk. Um, that was their way of saying that was their way of making a statement, you know, to say that we are opening our arms to blockchain. So some of these NFTs made it because they were the OGs. They were the very first one to implement sort of the idea and uti utility in the scene, uh, and that's why people always go back to you know the first few originals and stuff like that. But of course, there's a lot of different factors. You can also build your community from scratch. So if you have an idea to launch like maybe a, a MOE NFT, for example, like every school has their own NFT and stuff like that. So this is an idea that has to be built on. You get on the news, you start a Discord channel, you have students joining in, you have sort of like maybe media corp artists going in to talk about it and stuff. So these are all, it, it's something like, I would say it's something like running a company and how you want the company to get successful. There's, there's the media part of it. There's the tech part of it, and there's also a lot of social engineering part of it involved to make an NFT sort of like famous and valuable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was asking because I, I think at some point my students will ask me, why can't I just mint something and, and it becomes valuable? So, so uh, from what I'm hearing from you is that there, there is uh, that kind of uh, uh, reputation that you also need to build, that kind of uh, re uh, recognize uh, people recognizing you and your work and all those uh, uh, that, that will make it valuable. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you. I think there's no more questions, then we'll pass the time back to uh, Song Chi. And y'all can continue with the, the syllabus conversation. Uh, yep. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so, so in the interest of time, uh, uh, thanks, thanks to uh, uh, Mr. Brian and Mr. Sean for sharing uh, uh, two heavy but uh, uh, significant uh, uh, future uh, ready uh, uh, lessons. Right. So, so uh, in the interest of time, uh, we we just stay here uh, uh, instead of migrating, which will take some time uh, because it's also. Uh, uh, takes time for people to, to move forward. Okay, so so just in case people are interested, uh, uh, back in uh, 2018, uh, um, I I was quite crazy. So uh, in the promo paper, uh, I actually uh, set uh, a question on blockchain, right? Uh, using uh, using this, right? Uh, and and uh, if if people are interested, uh, I will uh, I, I'll share the the. The questions it's not perfect uh, there, there are a couple of issues there but uh, in case right uh, people may want to uh, uh, adapt it right if you want to connect some of these concepts uh, to to your syllabus right so but now uh what's important is that uh, we want to talk about uh, this uh, calendar of events uh, that's happening right so so actually every year uh, we we try to uh, compile a list of uh, things that will happen uh, for students and teachers that are computing related, right? Uh, so uh, later we will uh, share this link, right? Uh, 
for now, uh, feel free to ask any question, right? Um, so, so for now, uh, this year has not ended, right? Uh, so, uh, what is coming, uh, still, still coming next, uh, for, for the rest of the remaining 2021. Uh, so currently, uh, we have uh, another event called the Youth uh, Artificial Intelligence, uh, uh, I think competition for, for, for youth, right? Uh, so this is something that is happening on uh, on 20th of uh, November. It, so if your students uh, have uh, some uh, projects ready, uh, they can actually uh, participate and, and present it. Right? Yeah. So 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 the website is there. Right. Um, and uh, also there is this. Uh, uh, okay, Codiva is also happening. Like some of you have sent send your, your students. Then thanks for encouraging them them to take part. Um, and also, uh, if you are uh, if you receive the notification from NTU, uh, the School of Computer Science and Engineering, uh, they are also uh, doing uh, some robotics challenge. This are any event. Usually they have it uh, in January, but I think this year it is it shifted to to fourth December. Right then, uh, by Sorry, uh, you, you also have received this. Uh, if you would like to support the uh, AI Singapore Student Hackathon, so they have uh, put up a number of building blocks. Uh, uh, there is a, they call AI bricks, uh, right? So, so if uh, some of you are uh, uh, have your, your students are have nothing better to do uh, over the holiday, since not many people may be going on VTL. Then, then you can get them to register by 28. Uh, so the program is there and the website is also there. Right? Then uh, around usually end of every year, uh, around first week of December, uh, there will be an International Computer Science Education Week. Right? So there are quite a number of activities also to, to keep the, the, your, your students occupied. And there are also some resources like for teachers. Right? So, so that will roughly bring us to 2022. Right. So, uh, so twenty twenty two, uh, they will of course be about thirty plus teachers who are coming for for the conversion course to be trained to be competent teachers, and then uh, uh, fifteen Jan there will also be a SUTD uh pre university uh global crash competition, uh, of course they they supposed to be IPAC. Oh yeah, there's a Tezos hackathon. Right, uh, which is uh, what Mr. Brian told me. Right, uh, are you still there, Mr. Brian? Or disappeared? Okay, doesn't matter. So, so uh, they they are they are uh supposed to have uh some hackathon events, and uh, technically is usually mainly for um for university students. Right, but I think uh this year they. Uh, sorry, next year they, they are also interested to extend it to, to high school students. Right? Uh, so so uh, next uh, early January, uh, there are two rounds. One, sorry, late January to early Feb, and then uh, um, mid March to late mid, uh, sorry, mid March to late March, there will be a UK organized uh, competition for, for purse coding. So these are team based events that are quite uh beginner friendly so if you would like your your students to uh to pick up programming in a uh in a very uh, beginner friendly setting right? those are uh good enough uh, uh, uh platforms right then uh sometime in february uh, uh this year um nus they are thinking of bringing back the preliminary online contest right this will happen sometime in february and then, uh, of course, the actual NRI typically will be in, in, in March, which uh, uh, I think is okay. It, it, it depends on, on when it's open up, right? So so that they they will they will try to not to crash with, with that, right? So so if you are getting your students, uh, oh, I didn't put in the the year end uh training, right? So so that is ongoing. Uh, so if you are interested to get your students take part, uh, please. Send the registration by 19th of November, right? Which is uh, uh, this Friday, right? So, um, but apart from NOI, uh, uh, which is typically uh, they have a quota of about five, 
there's also a Google Kickstart. So they actually have it uh, almost uh, every month. Uh, and, and they actually allow uh, um, a variety of languages, right? So if your students who know C++, they can actually do it in Python, right? And this is uh, international, uh, so so it's also good for exposure. And the good thing is that uh, after the completion, they typically will provide or we need some analysis uh, for people to understand how the problem can be solved. And then also, uh, I think they do provide uh, links to the different uh, contestants' uh, solution, right? So you can also study other other people's uh, solution, right? So of course, uh, again, we will have uh, a much uh, for March, we will start some uh, student uh, workshop, and um, uh, specifically, actually, uh, Force Asia is also happening again. Uh, but next year, it will be totally online. It won't be hybrid uh, or physical because I think now uh, Europe has some resurgence of uh, COVID cases, right? So they are already planning for it online. But it's going to be held later, uh, seven to nine of April, because I think previously they had the uh, experience that. If they hold it during the school holiday, uh, it's only friendly to the to the mainstream uh, students, but uh, it is quite uh, a bad timing for the university students who typically uh, have have their exam uh, around March. Right. So so, but uh, we invite uh, if you have students who are uh, either passionate about uh, learning things on their own and they want to share it with a global audience, uh, you know, today we'll invite them to uh, to submit. Uh, uh, to to conduct some some online workshop, right? So it doesn't have to be something that is with is within the syllabus. Uh, they can go and learn something else. Uh, that is, uh, they 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 feel passionate about, and then they can share their learning. Uh, but uh, if you feel that it is also something that is useful for some of your students to uh, reinforce their understanding of the existing A level, uh, practical uh topics. Right, then we also typically have workshops uh, around those areas like Python, uh, 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 SQLite, uh, MongoDB, uh, uh, Flask. Right? So, so all these things um, is also useful for some of some of the students to to uh, take this as a practice uh, in in preparation for 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 their uh, A level uh, exam. Right? So um, then. They will be uh, okay, so so there is apart from the Google Kickstart. Google Kickstart is actually more for students, but Google Code Jam, uh, they that is actually an international, uh, competitive programming or algorithmic problem solving for uh professionals. But if you are a student, you can also take part, right? So typically, uh, when when I was at high, I I used to get my my students to clear the qualifying round, right? Uh, which is a twenty seven hour contest. So they just typically need to uh, do it within, uh, I think, a Saturday window, and then uh, they can just spend uh, three hours trying to solve some of the problem. And and uh, if they can clear the qualifying round, uh, that means uh, uh, that means they can essentially at least solve uh, one one plus uh, 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 questions, even if it's partial credit. Then actually, that that to them will be will be uh, quite quite good learning. So uh, there are other uh, local competitions such as uh, Doctor CT and then Ben Brass. Uh, those are locally held, and we will also invite uh, your your students to take part. Uh, even though uh, most of these are not uh, uh, code, uh, it's not a coding competition, right? But it's more on computational thinking concepts, right? So uh, next year, uh, the same organization, uh, Sim CC, the one who organized. Doctor City and Bebras, they are also going to organize uh, an, a high school data science competition, right? So I I provided the link to uh, the resources, right? So there's a curriculum uh, that they actually uh, got uh, some interns to uh, to uh, uh, to develop over um, uh, over the past two or three months. Right. So they are going to launch it uh, as a training curriculum. And after that, uh, they will get the students to uh, to come together to to uh, take part in some competition. Right. So, so this is something new. Uh, and the reason is that they feel that 
uh, data science is something that uh, needs to be uh, hopefully uh, the, the, the awareness needs to be developed uh, uh, earlier. Yeah. Then, uh, yeah. Then first week we will have building box and we are trying to find out think of a suitable metaverse environment right uh, next year for for the students right so uh next year they won't be i mean singapore won't be organizing the the city stem conference because the sponsor wanted it to be uh hosted next year uh, by some country in europe right so so we don't know the date because it depends on on uh when when they are typically free to host it right but uh, in place of that uh, NIE will will do this uh, city fest uh, for for teachers right so so we reach out to you uh, to, to 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 try to take part but uh, okay some of these dates are not fixed because um, we we know that uh, we also don't want to take up too much of the time and we don't want to especially eat into your your block period right but if you think that there are uh, some good suggestions of uh, suitable periods that that uh, that fits you uh, best uh, please let us know okay so so I want, just wanted to 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 share some of uh, another event okay so last year I was invited by CMCC to to go and take part in this uh, international Barbara's task workshop so essentially uh, it is something that uh, uh, all the uh, all the countries people come together to uh, to submit tasks and then to vet through them and to actually uh, fine tune them so that they are suitable for the international bench benchmark contest right? and, and I actually find the, the workshop quite uh, quite enriching because uh, a lot of the people setting these tasks are actually uh, uh, people who set the IOI and their country NOI tasks right just that they 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 tease out the all the essential uh, computing or informatics concepts and put it in a form that is more accessible to uh, to, to younger students right so uh, uh, if anyone is interested uh, uh, we we will invite you you to take part and and, and uh, see whether we can learn something from it and and uh, an advantage of doing taking part in this is that uh, they also provide you access to the entire archive of uh, past years of uh, computational thinking uh, problem set I, and so every year there, there's at least two three hundred uh, questions and then yeah that that would be something that uh that maybe you can find useful okay so there's a question is it oh yes yes uh, the vendor doing dr city and bear brass are the they are the same vendor right so they are again doing dr city and bear brass again but on top of that they are also going to do the the uh High school national uh, high school data science competition yeah okay okay so, so uh okay so it's already 501 um I, i'll just leave uh is there any uh question i, I won't go through uh, all the all the full list but uh, as you know uh, there are really many many opportunities uh, for our students and also for our teachers uh, to uh, to upgrade and and to continuous uh, uh, learn and hopefully apply uh, uh, a lot of computing uh, concepts and, and skills right so uh, in fact right, uh, given that we actually have the the most number of programs right compared to other other subjects uh, it, it's said that we still have very few students yeah okay <laughs> uh mr gi yeah do you think you can share that calendar with us so that it's easier uh when we plan for 2022 like which batch of students to send for or or, or or things like that so definitely okay i i'm going to put it in the chat so, so this is the link right uh if you know of any events they are not infected uh, please uh, let us know or or if you already uh are if, if you are willing to help to maintain this uh, i i am quite uh I, i'm more than happy to to give you the the uh, edit access right? but currently everyone at least have comment assess so if you have any questions or you 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 want to uh, uh, add more events you, you can also uh, do that by by adding a comment yeah okay uh, so so we will end here today un unless anyone has uh, has any burning questions yeah okay so so very much uh, th thanks very much for for coming for this year's uh, party
right so so we we typically uh try to do it uh uh end of uh end of a year uh and this is i, I don't know whether this is the i do did uh typically uh, we we chose it for the past couple of years uh to be on the day where the jc2 students have their last computing theory paper right because we we want to give the teachers a break don't let them worry too much about their students since once the students go into exam hall uh, there's there's nothing much uh, that we can really do and we just want to distract you all a bit right so that you, you can stop worrying about your, about your students yeah so but if you think that it's not uh, an ideal time or you think that uh, there is a better time uh, please please let us know right so that maybe more teachers can uh can can, can take part yeah Okay, if not, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, I take got, took got two extra three minutes of your time. So, so thanks very much for attending. And uh, if you remember to fill in the, the, the Easter egg thing, right? Uh, yeah, we, you will get your uh, free Tezos. Uh, uh, everyone will be given one free Tezos. Uh, that, that's the real thing, uh, not the not the test for set. Yeah. Okay, take care and, and see you around. Bye bye.